Okay, so again, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get started here with a just a pretty quick introduction and a jump in uh, right to the topic. Uh, you're going to be hosted here today by me, Jeff Alvarez, and by my best friend and colleague, Jeff Wilcox, who's going to just wave there and is going to start us off with some natural history information. He and I do have an agenda. We don't pass it around mostly because we might change our mind halfway through and uh, switch things around. We don't want you guys to get confused, but the idea is that you'll be following along on a lecture for probably about the next two and a half to three and a half hours. It really depends on the speed of our talking and how many questions you guys ask. Uh, but we're going to try to get through the lecture portion. Uh, it'll seem like a tremendous amount of information, and it is. Uh, we're going to give you lots of opportunity to, to ask questions in the field, to ask questions during the lecture. We're recording this, as most of you know, except for the people who came in late. Uh, and you can re-watch this later, uh, but only by invitation so that it just doesn't go out to the general public and kind of defeats the purpose of doing a workshop. So um, we do ask that as we go through our topics, we'll separate them into little groups. Uh, if you could hold off on your questions until the end of that segment, and you'll know when that end of the segment is, we'll announce it, and then you can ask questions of Jeff while I'm setting up for my presentations and questions of me when we're setting up for Jeff's presentations. So outside of that, I think we're going to just go ahead and get started. We're going to jump right in with uh, natural history and identification of red-legged frog with Jeff Wilcox. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're going to, my, my task here is to take you through the three main life stages of California red-legged frogs in the next few set of slides. And I'm starting out with a uh, almost an iconic photograph of a California red-legged frog uh, on the screen in front of you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat myself a lot going through because we want you to uh, pick up these characteristics, uh, and you're gonna get a lot more of this in the field as well. But this shot is uh, iconic for a few reasons. First of all, we call it a California red-legged frog, but I'm gonna immediately contradict myself by saying we never go by color. So. Uh, California red-legged frogs can have bright red legs, or they can have yellow legs, or they can have no color on the legs. So always be careful about color. Um, but the main thing to identify them by is the dorsal lateral fold, if you can follow my cursor, that starts essentially behind the eye, at least the most visible part, and runs the full length of the back down to the rump, almost to the insertion of the hind legs. If you have the right angle, you can see actually that it goes in front of the eye too, between the eye and the nares. I can tell gender on this frog, um, mostly because it's showing something called a nuptial pad, which is right here. And it's actually on the inside of the thumb, not the bottom, not the top, but the inside of the thumb. And we're gonna do this a couple of times just so you get this, because that's the first thing that you check for gender and the main thing that you check for gender. There are other things to look for, but they're all secondary to that. One of the secondary things that is gonna be presented right up front is these beefy big forearms, and you'll get a chance to see that later on uh, in the slideshow. And then finally, one of the things that we often look for is this stripe that's below the eye. Uh, again, we don't go by color, we go by form of that stripe and location. So it can be bright white, especially when they're young. Uh, and then it usually takes on one of the background body colors as they get older. Some people call it lipstick, some people call it a mustache but uh, it's, it's a thing to look for. Another one of those secondary ID characters. And then here's the, another reason we don't go by color. These are all California red-legged frogs uh, and just in various places and in various forms. So the one on your lower left has just transitioned from a tadpole and you see that that mustache is still quite bright. Um, and then so, but the identifying characteristic on all four of them is the dorsolateral fold. You can see it on the dark one. You can see it on the reddish one. Well, the dark reddish one, the, the true reddish one, and then also on the metamorph. And then the other thing to look for, because sometimes people want to tell the difference between these and other species of frog, and we'll get to more of that later. But this, the eardrum is quite small. It's also called the tympanum but the tympanum is quite small, your drum is quite small compared to, for example, bullfrogs. But I can't say it often enough, 
dorsal lateral fold is the first thing you're looking for. Oh, there's the, there's the uh, mustache also, or lipstick. So again, don't go by color. This is kind of the theme in the first few slides. Don't go by color because again, these are the same frogs. The one on the right is probably much colder than the one on the left. Their skin is, uh, how would you say, suffused with melanophores. And so they can change their skin color and their skin hue when they need to. It usually is for thermoregulatory purposes, but just be careful when you pick up a dark frog versus a light frog, they are one and the same. So gender, this is what I showed you in the first slide also. Be careful because um, what we're trying, I'm gonna jump ahead to the next slide just to illustrate. What we're looking for is the structure on the right. And again, it's on this part of the thumb. It's not on this part. It's not on that part. It's here, right? And so we would probably call that medial. And you'll see that it's used for a specific purpose later on in a few slides. But be careful, I'm gonna go back to the original slide because when you're looking, the one on the left is a female and she has these little, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but little processes, let's call them, or little lumps, grumps, blips, whatever. But they're here too on the male. Here's the middle one, here's the one on the right, here's the one on the left, middle, right, left. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking here where the arrow points, and here where the tissue actually, this, the type of tissue changes, you can see that it's got these little proximal uh, spots. It also has a different texture. It's quite grippy and rubbery. And that's the spot we're looking for. So that's the nuptial pad that determines male from female. But focus your glance down on the forearm as well. So if you look at those forearms, you see how beefy the one on the right is. That's a male. And he uses that because he's going to grip the female in a particular hole during reproduction. Uh, and a couple of more things uh, to tell a male from me, female. Again, don't go by color, right? Because these are identical species. Females are usually larger. They often also have a, a more blunt nose. You're only going to be able to discern this after seeing a lot of frogs. And you're only going to be able to discern this after the frogs have sexually differentiated. You can't tell in young frogs, so don't even try. And then also, um, well, I, on the, on the red, I'm sorry, the two slides on the right, look at the forearms again. Any of you are, uh, are cartoon fans, the, the male looks like Popeye with the beefy forearms. Um, and the female is just, she doesn't change over the year, the male does. Uh, but the other thing to notice is on the left-hand side, um, and I would use my own fingers, but it would become a rude sign if I did that actually, or maybe I'll just leave all my fingers out. But you can see on the webbing, um, look at the middle toe of the frog on the left, the webbing approaches the uh, one, two, three, fourth. So it's the second knuckle from the tip. If it's a female and somehow or other, it's gonna touch the first knuckle forward if it's a male. It might do it on only one side and you really have to spread the hind foot to see it. You can't just see it when the foot is relaxed. We use this as another secondary uh, uh, sign for gender only in red-legged frogs and only in frogs that have good feed and good repair, I would say. So we have a site in the Sierra Nevada where uh, most of the site is granite. And in Mexico also, there's a lot of granite and a lot of sand. And the webbing and the toes can wear down. And so this becomes a far less reliable way to determine gender. It's secondary anyway, because it's not always 100% um, determinable. Let's put it that way. Okay, so next, uh, we're gonna go through the next couple of life stages. So here we actually have all three on the slide. The, the adult is on the upper right and you can nicely see the dorsal lateral folds even though it's covered with duckweed, but it goes all the way down the body and you can see that it goes in front of the eye here. I hope everybody can follow my cursor. Mm -hmm. Then the next, um, so adults get together and they lay egg masses. And so those are the two on, whoops, I'm sorry. The two on the bottom right, um, when they're freshly laid, they look on the like the one on the far right. So they have gelatinous capsules that cover each egg 
the capsules are sticky, which causes the masses to form together. Uh, and when in their first laid, actually, they're smaller and denser and darker, and they actually take on sort of a gray-blue hue. But these membranes are hygroscopic, and so they take on water and they become larger, each one about the size of a pea with the ovum in the center. Um, and But as the day go, days go on, uh, particulates settle out, algae grows on the surface of the eggs, and then you get the appearance of the one on the left. The eggs at the surface are too dehydrated probably to host any algae at the surface, but all the ones on the, on the bottom side have become not opaque, but less transparent. And that's because they're covered with uh, probably just, um, what am I trying to say, particulates from the water and then also algae. Uh, and there probably is some symbiosis going on with the algae. It may provide oxygen to the eggs. It also may help them stay warmer when they're exposed to sunlight. Uh, and warmer water and warmer eggs help the eggs develop quickly. So more quickly they develop also, uh, the less isolated and unprotected they are. So then they hatch out and they fall to the bottom and they have better protection at the bottom of the pond. Hey Jeff, just, are... just a second. Griffin had a, his little hand up. Okay, Thanks. if it was his big hand, I might've been able to see yeah. it. <laughs> Can you hey, hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks for, for um, calling on me there. I was just wondering, is that about the size of a softball, grapefruit? Thank you. Thank you. I kind of skipped over that part. So they would range between a softball and a monstrous grapefruit, probably even more like a, a, a cantaloupe. So that's usually how big they get. About two to 4,000 eggs per mass as opposed to a bullfrog, which can be 20 to 25,000 per egg. Yeah. So, um, so we'll, we'll talk about all these things in the field, but um, competitively bullfrogs are way ahead in, just in terms of numbers. Did that answer your question? You could, yeah, there you go. Thank yes, you. thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. And so, and then we have the larvae on the, uh, the remaining screen. Um, we're gonna we're gonna next gonna show you bullfrogs. So what I'd like you to do is on the upper right hand side really pay attention to the spotting pattern on the back of this beautifully uh, grown, nicely developed red-legged frog larva. Um, you can actually see from this one it's already got hind legs, uh, still larva but hind legs, and it's already starting to form these dorsolateral folds down the down the back. So it's beginning to transform into the terrestrial form. Um, one of the nice things, not always visible, one of the nice convenient things about identification is that oftentimes California red-legged frogs have this as a chain of gold dots down their lateral lines. Yes, I said lateral lines just like fishes. So, uh, but one of, the, one of the ways, a main way of telling uh, larvae aside from size apart um, is by where the fin originates. So the fin is separate from the tail and here, is the musculature of the tail structure. It goes down to a point like this. Uh, I may not be getting act like it's something blocking my view, but so that's the tail itself. The fin is the translucent part that surrounds the tail. It goes like that. So one of the key characters, and you really have to have them in hand to see this or in a nice transparent uh, terrarium or aquarium, you can see where on the body the fin originates. And it's easier at some angles than in others. But if you look down at this bottom slide, you can see that even on the tiniest guy, uh, so you have a really small red-legged frog and you have a really, uh, or sorry, a medium one that doesn't have any legs yet, but the fin originates right about there. So about mid-body. Um, and it's not gonna do that uh, on any other one except for one, but the two are simple to tell apart. So actually, uh, and we'll see later, the hardest to tell these differentiate from uh, are actually toads at this size, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, I think I'm just gonna pop to the next one. Oh, well, what I should say too is the lifetime strategy for frogs is really to take advantage of the vernal explosion of green that happens in ponds. And so the larvae are aquatic. They derive their oxygen from the water through gills the gills, or the water is actually sucked in through the mouth, pumped in through the gills, which are located right about here, but they're covered by an operculum. 
And then there's a siphon on the side where the water evacuates. Um, so how do you tell a, 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 an urine from a caudate? So how do you tell a frog larva from a salamander larva? Salamander larva has external gills. Frog larva has internal gills. They're covered, you're not gonna see them. Um, and so they take advantage, they, they, the terrestrial form, which is the adult, gathers at a pond or a creek, lays eggs. Those eggs hatch out in the vegetarian larvae. Those larvae take advantage of the crazy explosion of algae and other sorts of things in the pond. And then as the ponds diminish or dry down or they eat themselves out of house and home, then they transform into a terrestrial form, which is the frog. And they're gonna be terrestrial the, le the rest of their life. And I want you to get the word terrestrial and frogs associated together because our native frogs are not aquatic frogs. They're terrestrial frogs. They only come to water. I shouldn't say only, but they mostly come to water to breathe. So that's their association with water is they have a life stage that's obligated to water, but the adults are terrestrial. Next one up is one of the ones that uh, often are gonna be confused with California red-legged frogs, but I'm gonna to toggle. If you look at the adult that's the, in the largest picture, look how fine and, and uh, bold those spots are on the back. That doesn't change. And look how really well defined the edges of the spots are as opposed to the blotchy, diffuse ones there. So that's a main thing. This is just one of those things that you have to train your eye to spot. So bullfrog larvae get a lot larger, um, but uh, there, are, there are times during their development where all the larvae can be the same size. So you can't really go by size. So the best thing to do is look at the spotting pattern and even though it's not as depicted as well in the drawing here, if you look at the bullfrog larva, the fin originates right there, almost at the, at the end of the body. Um, and it's depicted pretty well here, but I think it's a little confusing on this one because there's a little bit of a connector here for some reason, but at, anyway, because the body is quite flat there. But if you look, the fin actually starts here, whereas in the red-legged frog, it was about there. So those are the two most important things to look at. Um, if you look at the adult, it does have a tympanel or an oral fold, but it does not have a dorsal lateral fold all the way down and nothing in front of the eye. So that's the, the first thing you look at is you look for that dorsal lateral fold and if it's absent, it's not a red-legged frog, it's probably going to be a bullfrog in our country. And then I mentioned earlier, and this is not very, graceful or proper or um, it's just not very proper, I guess. But to me, uh, a, a red-legged frog and a yellow-legged frog egg mass, they're both things of beauty. I mean, they're really inspiring when you look at them. The color changes that they go through, the shapes that they attain. Bullfrog egg masses are ugly and it looks like a giant just hawked and spit. You see the foam that's often associated with them? Just gross. And the eggs are tiny, tiny, tiny compared to the big, beautiful ova on, on red-legged frogs. So um, bullfrogs ugly, California red-legged frogs, stunningly beautiful. Uh, and then the next native frog we're gonna look at is the foothill yellow-legged frog. Uh, again, beware of trying to determine by color. And in neither of these photographs do you see a yellow leg. And oftentimes, if you get a glimpse of a frog, since most of the color is on the underside, you're not gonna see the yellow leg anyway. So it's far more important to find other landmarks to identify them from. One thing, uh, it doesn't show up as well in the red one, um, but you can probably imagine it being there, is a pale triangle between the eyes. Uh, you have to try to get a good look. These are smaller frogs and, and it's tough to get up a, a close. They do have dorsal lateral folds, but they are incomplete and they're not very raised. Fortunately, oftentimes they sort of are um, emphasized by color underneath. They often have a rufous or a brick color underneath. This one does not, but it does have a dorsal lateral font line that you can see. It goes up to about there. You can see it doing this right here. Uh, nothing in front of the eye, no dorsal lateral fold in front of the eye. And uh, the skin texture is very different from any others that you'll see. And I realize that 
skin texture is not a great thing to go on. So on this frog, it's really the presence of some things and the absence of others. So you don't see any of those big blotchy spots on this frog. Um, and that's oddly enough, it's the absent things that often make it more identifiable than anything else. The other thing that's going to lend to identifying it, um, and although both frogs occur in streams, this one's almost 100% the stream obligate. We do find it in ponds, especially Jeff Alvarez and I, um, it seems, uh, but, um, but most people find them in streams and that's probably where you're going to find them. For the egg masses, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even notice the guy up in the corner. So it's got a little rufous on its dorsolateral fold and actually shows up a lot better. Um, but for the egg masses, they're going to be more like uh, varying between a tangerine and a full-on orange. So that's about the size they are. What's very different about them is that they are the ova. So the egg inside is much larger compared to the envelope it's in. So the whole overall egg mass appears darker. Um, you're going to find them in quieter waters, in streams most of the times, off channel, behind a rock some place where they can take advantage of the, the boundary layer. So that layer where uh, it's kind of quiet where all the water runs over the top of it. So the, the fast water is going over the top and oftentimes forms a quiet eddy behind a rock or some other structure. That's probably where you're gonna find the eggs. And they're also gonna be in the sunniest parts of the stream. Uh, rare that you find them under any kind of canopy. The larvae, and we found out firsthand uh, just a couple weeks ago, well, we knew this going in, but it was reinforced, how's that? Um, are very difficult to tell from toad larvae, primarily because like almost all the other larvae, they have eyes on the inside of the margin of the head. Our next example is gonna be the only one without, so I'm pointing that out now. You can contrast it. Um, and the tail starts way back on the body like a bullfrog, but they never get nearly as big. Um, and for us, probably the, the the biggest, uh, well, behavior is what uh, differentiates them, but you're not gonna be able to see that unless you have them in some sort of container probably. They are dorsal ventrally compressed more than any other larvae because they're shaped for living in a stream environment. And probably the thing that stuck out to me most is that you don't really see the musculature of the tail. It looks like a camel pattern. It's got lots of spotting and blotching, et cetera. And then the, the tail fin, is there's an exaggerated hump right in the middle. That's really, to me, when I see them side by side with other larvae, that's kind of the dead giveaway. Unfortunately, it doesn't give nearly as well in drawings as it does in a container, but um, we'll do our best to get you exposed to that at some point. And then finally, this is the most simple larva of all the native frogs that you're gonna encounter in our area to identify. And one of the major things that strikes you right off is that the fin starts right at the back of the eye. So it's the most far forward on any larva that we will see. Of course, again, you'll have to have it in hand or you'll have to have it in a clear container. But the other thing, and this is one that you should know automatically whenever you're doing larval surveys, and that is that if you look straight down on the larva, the eyes are located on the outside margin of the head. You can see that here. They touch the outside margin. If any of you are familiar with uh, identifying Tarika uh, newts, it's that same idea. You look straight down and you look at the position of the eyes in association with the margin of the outside of the head. On these, uh, the eggs are tend to, tend to be paler than on ronids, and also they're much smaller. So I'd say, you know, uh, peanut to walnut size, and they can vary in shape and length, but, uh, and they can also be easily confused with newt eggs but probably the easiest way to test the difference is to touch them. So if you touch these, these are gonna be like loose jello. And if you touch uh, nude eggs, they're gonna be like a firm rubber ball. So that's the biggest difference. And the nude eggs do tend to be more concentrically round, but you know, none of this stuff is carved in stone. And as I like to say, the animals themselves don't read the field guides, they just do what they're gonna do. Ah, and then lastly, the toads. So the first thing uh, about toads is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at the adult in the upper right, is the warty appearance of the skin. Uh, and, and they're not really warts per se, but, but the skin is usually heavily textured with these warty 
things. And also it's hard to see in this, uh, from this vantage point, but they have large parotid glands right behind the eyes. And that's where they exude toxin from. So be careful, do not eat toads. Um, and then in proportion to their body, the feet are, the hind legs, sorry, are much more spindly and, and a little bit shorter. So they're not really built to hop like a frog is built to, to hop or to is built. built. Frogs are specialized hoppers. Uh, these guys can hop a little bit, but mostly they walk. So their form of locomotion is walking and that's what they're built for. So that's one of the major differences. But then they lay eggs that come in strings. So they look like clear rice noodles with little specks inside. And they'll do this all along the, the perimeter of a pond. You almost always find them in very shallow water wrapped around vegetation or other structures. And they can be really, really long. I mean, like 30, 40 feet long for one string of eggs. When they hatch out, they are again, whoops, I lost it. Sorry, guys. There it is. Um, when they hatch out, they look, these are the ones that are most easy to confuse with uh, foothill yellow legged frogs. They both occur in streams, so you have to be careful of that. But in this case, the tail is much smaller, much more narrow, I would say. And then the fin is the furthest back of all. So even with the yellow legged frog, the fin starts probably about here, and it has a similar swale and this pronounced middle. But these guys start even further back. Um, and we have a photograph of them in the, palm, in the palm of Jeff's hand because one of the ways to test them is they don't flip over very well. They are um, very much built to stay on their stomach like this and they, they don't go anywhere. Uh, they also are, often have a dark abdomen. But the thing to notice is that really, really well-defined narrow tail structure. That's what really... Uh, makes them stand out. Now for all these larvae, you can look at tooth rows and we'll show you how to do that in the field. It's more definitive than anything else because tooth rows don't change among species. Um, but that takes a little bit of structure in, or I mean um, teaching and a little bit of study, um, but it is the way that you tell tadpoles apart in the field. Anybody have any questions? Jeff, if you can unshare your screen. Hi, um, I just had a real quick question. Um, sure. With the larvae, they, they could be mistaken for CRLF or for the red-legged frog because of where the, where the fin starts. Which larvae? So uh, uh, yes, sorry, we, the, we, Western, the Western toad. Western toads, yes. Now, only at a certain size because red-legged frogs get much larger. But when they're both the same side, it's very different, same size, I'm sorry, it's very difficult to tell them apart. So you're going to try to get them in the palm of your hand, and some you'll flip over and some you won't. Um, that's one way to tell the difference. But yes, another way is, first of all, where that fin starts on the body, because on the red-legged frog, it's going to be midway up the body, and on the, on the toad, it's going to be at the very back of the body, almost not even touching the body, really. Um, and then if you're fortunate, that dorsal lateral line will be gold flecked in the uh, in the red-legged frog, even at that size, but you might need a hand lens to see it. The best thing to do is get them side by side, the ones in question in the palm of your hand, take a photograph with your phone, and then expand the photograph so you have a magnified picture. And that should show you what you need. But if you're still confused, and you're likely to be, because we are sometimes, if you're likely to be, you flip them over, if you can, Wait for them to start gasping. And as soon as their mouth's open, just start clicking photos, clicking photos, and then search through for the one in focus. Whip out your handy field guide, which of course is in your back pocket all the time, and count the tooth rows. Keep in mind also that um, most of these frogs have black tadpoles or black larvae. And, uh, and one of the characteristics we often use to say, oh, that's a toad tadpole is that it's black, but you don't wanna use color because all these little frogs, red leg, yellow leg, they're all gonna go through a black phase, bullfrog as well. So uh, color isn't really the way to go. And with a certain size of bull, or sorry, Western toad that Jeff was mentioning, they all have the same coloration and there are little details you can use, but it still makes it very tricky. So just keep that piece in mind. It's the trickiest stage of the life history of a frog for most people. 
including us. And and just so you guys know, uh, well, let me just jump back and let uh, Angel ask his question because I know he had one earlier. Go ahead. Hey, um, I uh, I was wondering if there is uh, some sort of ecological reason why um, these frogs and toads lay their eggs in like a in like a mass and a string versus uh, plopping like an individual egg somewhere. There, I'm sure there are many ecological questions. I don't have those answers, Jeff. No, I only have a bit of a guess. But if you look at species like uh, red-legged frogs that do suffer from some egg predation, you know that the eggs on the outside get eaten and some of the eggs on the inside don't get eaten. So if you had a very small egg mass or one that was just individual eggs, they're going to get eaten individually and be it'd be easier to predate them. But that's just a guess based on what I see in the field. But if you look at all of the frogs and toads and throw in spadefoot, uh, all of them do something a little bit different. And even though we say toads lay strings, not all toads do. Uh, spadefoot do little egg clusters, but they're very small, more like a newt. So they all kind of do something a bit different. And when you switch over to salamanders, every one of them does something different. So th they're all trying to do something, which is keep their eggs alive. That really is the goal. Uh, there is no other mechanism that they're worried about at that stage or level. So it's got to be about predation. You know, I have to admit that's a guess, but it's an educated guess. Thank you. And just so you guys know, we're, Jeff and I are old guys. Um, we're struggling as it is to do Zoom. So uh, if you do have questions um, you and you put them in the chat, it might be 10 minutes before we even see that because you know we're just like limping along here as it is. But uh, if we miss your question, uh, please do just ask it in the field and do ask it if you don't mind, because most of you have similar questions and everybody just seems afraid to ask, uh, but nobody can see your face. So even if you ask sort of what you would consider a silly question, nobody cares, you know, that it's you just ask it. Uh, and so we're going to do a little bit of a shift here. So I'm going to jump into taxonomy and distribution, but I do want to make sure you guys ask your questions of Jeff. So anybody else have any other questions for Jeff? Great. So uh, yeah, do ask questions. Uh, this this topic that I'm going to be doing, not so fun, not so exciting, but still important. So um, if you have lots of questions, I wouldn't blame you. But often nobody asks any questions because they're just kind of rolling their eyes or looking at their phone or whatever. I get it, but this is going to be important anyway. So uh, I'm going to jump into taxonomy and distribution. Taxonomy will be very brief because quite honestly, I roll my eyes at this. So on the left hand side of the screen, uh, this is the old um, sort of the old school version. This is back when the frog was just described. So in 1852, Baird and Girard described the frog as a single species with three subspecies. Uh, they had up in the upper left, uh, the northern red-legged frog, the lower and center portion of the, the range was the California red-legged frog. And this little blotch over here by Lassen was uh, the Cascades red-legged frog. So if you fast forward to 2003, so essentially about 145 years later, uh, Stebbins came along and decided, well, it's probably not that broad of a breakdown. And he really looked a lot more closely at the range of the species, not that it was becoming you know, reduced in its range, but he found that they don't really range as far as Baird and Girard thought. Uh, in fact, it turned out to be more species in there. So Stebbins refined this down to three subspecies still, uh, sorry, two subspecies, but an intergrade zone in the blue. So now we're on the right map. So in the purple, northern red-legged frog, the blue, a big intergrade zone between northern red-legged frog and California red-legged frog. And then the red is all California red-legged frog. So I'm just moving the map to the left now. So it's the same map, nothing changed. Uh, and I put in Schaefer's map 2004. Schaefer couldn't leave well enough alone. Had to one up Stebbins. So he made his own map uh, using genetic differentiation for these and then split them into species. So Northern red-legged frog increased its range by going south all the way into Mendocino County. California red-legged frog essentially stayed the same and the range stayed about the same. But if you notice, they went from subspecies to species. Everyone quickly accepted this. 
it seemed to be very biologically sound and reasonable, uh, but it did pose kind of a weird question that was more about the, the little intergrade zone. Stebbins had this very wide intergrade zone that included three counties. Now Schaefer has essentially zero. But we're going to look at that a little more closely here. Uh, but before we do, I just want to say um, the range itself is really an interpretation of where we believe the frog is. So if I scoop back to, to uh, Schaefer and Stebbins ranges, they're essentially the same. Now I'll move forward. This map is my range map. It's a range map I've created based on observations and my own knowledge. So again, the purple is northern red-legged frog. We're going to ignore it for this workshop. Uh, the red is California red-legged frog, but I put in some yellow blotches, and those are areas where we really have very little idea of what's going on. So it doesn't mean the frog isn't present. It doesn't mean it's extirpated or reduced in numbers. It really means these are big areas of private property that we have no access to, and we just have very little idea of what's happening with red-legged frogs there. So if you work in this area, be, um, be one of those people who helps me out and put it on iNaturalist or CNDDB or both. If you do it on a natural stroke, get on CNDB. Uh, but we really want to answer some of the questions about these yellow blotches. It's probably pretty important so we know if the frog's still maintaining its populations in these areas. But essentially, it's, the range is about the same as what Stebbins wrote, except if you notice, and I'm going to go back again, uh, the lower half of California is now gone uh, from the range map. And if you, you're paying close attention, the southern coast range actually widens out. So uh, we, we know it moves, this frog moves all the way into the Central Valley. It's on the floor of the Central Valley, on the west edge of the valley in particular. And then I add this little blotch down here, seems sort of haphazard, but in Baja, California. But this becomes really critical in a minute here. But there is um, several populations in Baja, California, and some of the folks that are in our workshop have been on a work, a, an additional workshop to that area and seen these frogs. So here's where it becomes important. So red-legged frogs from the Baja California population were translocated to Orange County at a site where they were extirpated at the Santa Rosa Plain, or I'm sorry, Santa Rosa Plateau. And then another population was uh, transplanted to a private ranch in San Diego County uh, from this population in Mexico. So now we've moved southern population California red-legged frogs into Southern California and we we selected those popular, or sorry, the uh, we selected the Baja California population because genetically speaking, that was likely what was there. So those are the ones that got moved. And in the absence of the ones in Baja, we wouldn't have been able to move them in an effective manner. So we're starting to build populations back into Southern California. I think the new plan for next year might be three or four no, new locations. We're going to have to just wait and see. But outside of those two little spots, we don't believe they occur until you hit northern or northwestern Los Angeles County. So uh, then speaking more about these, some of these populations that um, I'm adding to my own map is this one up here near uh, Glen County and Calusa County, the little blue arrow shows you. Uh, there is an observation of California red-legged frogs here. The problem is that it's um, actually unconfirmed, meaning nobody that has a lot of experience with this species has seen the frog there. Uh, it was reported on iNaturalist. There is a photo, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean the frog was seen right at the location on the map. It could be a, an incorrect location, so we want to make sure we get that confirmed. Uh, here's another location that is of note, and that is uh, we have red-legged frogs at Point Reyes National Seashore, and it's important because if you look right here, they're about elevation zero. So um, they might be a half a foot elevation or so. I'll show you a photo of the site that we're in in a little while. Uh, but they range from this elevation uh, to about here in the Sierras at this elevation, which is 3,200 feet, the big gun site at Michigan Bluff. Uh, we visit that on a red-legged frog level two workshop. But if you go way down here, where most people don't even realize red-legged frogs still occur, except when they come to this kind of workshop, uh, the red-legged frogs range all the way up to 6,200 feet, which is about the elevation of Lake Tahoe. So in Mexico, they range from around 900 feet elevation to 6,200 feet. Quite a range difference, very, very different than California, and uh, certainly an interesting population. Jeff and I have seen that population at 6,200 feet and lots of these other ones in between. 
So here's that funny little zone that I was talking about that Schaefer wanted to focus on when he did his work. So I'm switching to his map. So this is right out of his paper from 2004. So that little spot on my map is right here where this little box is. So uh, northern red-legged frog up here. Southern, or sorry, California red-legged frog down here in the dark gray. Uh, the intergrade zone is what Stebbins used to be pointing out. That's what they're um, pointing out here is Stebbins um, intergrade zone, not Schaefer's intergrade zone. Schaefer's intergrade zone is right here in the little red box. So uh, what Schaefer did was really focus on drainages and tried to figure out, okay, what is the dividing line where the species occurs north of it, south of it, and then there's intergrades in between. And what he found was the intergrade zone was really about five kilometers wide rather than about 500 kilometers wide. So super small. It's between Big River in Mendocino County and Mills Creek. So uh, essentially uh, four little river drainages where they seem to be going back and forth or there's intergrades uh, rather than you know three different counties. So if you're in this area, I, I think life is gonna suck for you, but if you're outside of this area, pretty clear, easy to deal with. You just use uh, Schaefer's paper and say, well, I'm north of Big River, so it's gotta be Northern California red-legged frog, or I'm south of Mills Creek, so it's gotta be California red-legged frog. Uh, so uh, it makes it, quite easy, except uh, for those people who are working right in that little gap. And if you don't already know, I should just jump back here. If you don't already know, uh, the service, so the federal government, does look at this kind of thing very clearly and says, and they have a, a, a write-up in the federal register that says, if it looks like the endangered species and we can't differentiate it from other, any other species, we're going to call it the endangered. That means any intergrade, so whether it's 99%, 1%, or the opposite, 1%, 99%, doesn't matter. If it's got any of the endangered in it or threatened in it, then it's going to be the endangered or threatened species or subspecies. So keep that in mind. Just because you're in the intergrade zone doesn't mean you get to plow under everything. See somebody in the chat, of course. Yeah, so uh, the question is, are there any morphological, morphological differences between northern red-legged frog and California red-legged frog? I would say if you put 10 of each in, an, in two different buckets and didn't tell me which was in each bucket, I would struggle. I've seen both of them. I've seen a lot of each of them. Uh, I would still struggle. The way we differentiate is uh, geographically, so we look at the map or listen to their calls, but the problem is that their calls can be very similar. So California red-legged frog often puts a little sort of a, a sweep at the end. So it does something like pop, 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 or where a northern red-legged frog goes pop, 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 pop. But California red-legged frog can drop that little sweep at the end. So you're kind of messed up here too. So you really just want to use the map. If you use the map, you're safe. Everything north of Big, uh, Big River is northern. Everything south of Big River is either Intergrade or California. So it's all California. So um, I'm going to drop off um, my little section here and hand it back over to Jeff. But while he's putting his screen up, you can go ahead and ask any other questions. So Jeff is going to hit share screen. I see a hand. Go ahead. Uh, hey, you mentioned something called like CNDB. It, oh. That was uh, something other than INAT. Uh, and could you mention that one more time, maybe a little slower. Yeah, no problem at all. And thanks for bringing that up. I think some of these things become sort of normal to me and to lots of other people. And I assume everybody knows it, but it's not true. So uh, the CNDD, uh, yeah, CNDDB, I <laughs> got it messed up in my own head, is the California Natural Diversity Database. It's the state clearinghouse for all of the observations for uh, rare, threatened, and declining species. And uh, that is managed by, uh, thank you, <laughs> Rochelle. So, yeah, CNDB. Uh, it's managed by the California Department of Fish and Game. It, to get access to it, it costs $600 by subscription per year. And what you get from that is access to all of the state's observations, minus all the ones they don't want you to know where 
uh, those specific locations are, and it's quite a few actually. Uh, so what ends up happening is if you put it on iNaturalist, uh, they will send all those rare and endangered species of the CNDDB, which works out just fine for the CNDDB. Uh, the problem is that they become obscured both on iNaturalist and on the CNDDB. So uh, you really have to have a subscription and you have to request specific locations. But keep in mind, and I'm going to talk about permits in a couple of minutes, uh, if you get a permit, state permit or federal permit, you're required to submit to the CNDDB. That means this little jacked up form that you find online that's kind of hard to submit and has a lot, takes a lot of time to submit each one, uh, but you have to do it. It's part of your, your uh, permit mandate. So in my case, uh, if I don't submit anything to the CNDDB by the end of the year, they email me and say, we know you handle stuff all year long, or we know you see things all year long. You need to start submitting or we're not going to approve your permit. And then when I give them like 30 or 40, they say, uh, th yeah, we don't want 10% of your observations. We want all of them. So keep in mind that this is going to be a requirement. It's also a requirement on biological opinions and LSAAs, uh, Lake and Stream Bank Alteration Agreements. I'll talk a lot about permits in a little while um, and get into some of those details. Did you have a follow up question? So if we have a permit already, uh, we should probably ha have the subscription to CNDDB uh, so that we can start making those uploads. You definitely should. You can find the, the application or the, um, the form, the data form online, and you should start submitting those ASAP. Uh, especially if you work for a company, you want to establish that you submit those things because it does take time and that should be integrated into any proposal you guys are doing so that you do have time to submit those. The, it is a, a very valuable resource. I've used it for lots of my publications. I always use it and you're required to use it when you're doing a CEQA review, NEPA review, uh, etc. But it is not the sole source. You should not just be using CNDDB. You should be using a naturalist all the museum records. You should be calling people like Jeff or me if we're in your area or any other person that may be knowledgeable. Uh, we read that people do this all the time, but nobody ever calls me. They, they just say, well, we talked to all the knowledgeable individuals and didn't find any new observations. But uh, they, people do rely on the CNDDB. I'll talk about that more in the permitting part. Uh, it is an important thing. I think we're not only uh, obliged to do it because of the permits that we hold, but professionally, we should be obligated to do it. We should feel a professional obligation to submit to the CNDB, irrespective of how much time it takes. It, it should be something we all feel responsible for. So I'm going to drop out and let Jeff jump in. Oops, I went too far here. Stop share. There it is. Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. I just wanted to say, uh, if we do miss your question, we're going to be sitting around afterward. We can answer all the questions you guys have when you make it to the field portion, which we feel is mandatory for you to get credit. Uh, you can ask as many questions as you want as, as well. So Jeff's going to jump in. And ask some of the same questions too, because not everybody will have heard them go by. Um, and so please bring them up again. Uh, there were some really good questions about egg masses and placement and shape and those are great things to discuss in the field. So I'm going to take you through breeding behavior and oviposition sites. Since we're talking about California red-legged frogs, I'm going to restrict the conversation to the range from November to April, which is primarily when red-legged frogs breed. The breeding season is closely tied to rainfall events. And the reason for that, well, we sort of got at earlier, and that is that the larval form is aquatic. So there has to be water. And in California, a lot of water arrives very seasonally. So it starts usually arriving in the fall, <laughs> depending upon the year. Uh, and then the two slides I'm depicting below, uh, is that's the wettest year we've ever had here. So this is the field site that you're going to visit. When you visit, it's going to look very different from these slides. Uh, but the one on the left is of Copeland Creek uh, with a couple of feeder streams adding to the, to the flow. And the pool right in front where the blackberries are is what we call oviposition pool because California, or sorry, uh, foothill yellow-legged frogs reliably oviposit in that pool once the flows subside. And the pool on the upper left is what we call run pool. That's the only pool in the creek that red-legged frogs have oviposited in. And then on the right, just for scenic beauty and 
crazy drama is um, cauldron pool, and we get foothill yellow-legged frogs, California red-legged frogs, and uh, California giant salamander in that pool often. I'm going to jump uh, right uh, in just, just for uh, a quick second, uh, just so you guys know, we're going to the site for our field effort. This It'll look completely different, but uh, Jeff sort of alluded to the fact that we get California giant salamander, foothill yellow-legged frog, red-legged frog, and others. So it is a good site. It's uh, easy to access, and I think you guys will enjoy it when you get out there. Sorry, Jeff. Thank you. So um, all the position sites, one of the things, and, and it's no coincidence, coincidence that the first two sets of slides are all stream environments. That is because nowadays we associate California red-legged frogs with ponded environments. But in California, ponds are not a historically common feature. Most of the ponds that you will visit for surveys or that you will visit to find frogs are human-made reservoirs. Thank goodness for us, uh, because the frog is in peril, thank goodness for us, it's been able to spill over into those reservoirs and seems to actively be sort of moving its own life history that way primarily. But before that, they probably bred in slow moving streams or slow moving spots in streams. One on the left is Mexico, uh, and my colleague is the, the front person on the right, uh, diligently searching for frog eggs. and. Um, I believe that we found them. I'm not sure if this is the same site, but in a site like this. So out of the main flow, against a bank or some other structure where the water slows down and they have less of a problem adhering, but also the where they can be exposed to the sun at some portion of the day. Also on the right, my colleague is pointing to, actually he's pointing to one, but there were two egg masses here. And you can see from the attitude of the aquatic vegetation, that the high flows have passed. And so they've waited for the high flows to pass and then laid their eggs in the quieter waters. This is at Los Vaqueros uh, uh, drainage in Contra Costa County. So what happens is the males gather first at the breeding territory. The top photo, uh, the arrows point to three males. They're actually in a pool in a stream in Mexico. But the males gather first and they await the arrival of the females. Females are in control of everything regarding brood production. My opinion, that's the way it should always be, but let's not do politics. Um, anyway, remember we, we talked about nuptial pads. So here they are on display. On the left hand side, you have a male in amplexus. Uh, we call this uh, pectoral amplexus. So he's using his beefy forearms and those sticky grabby pads on the insides, on the insides of the foot, not the bottom, not the top, the insides here, to latch on to her. And he's latching on for dear life. So frogs, primarily uh, native frogs, well, I might get into the weeds here, but California red-legged frogs are what we term explosive breeders. So not from the male point of view, the males are there waiting for any chance to get lucky but the females come for a brief time and they usually come from afar. So they'll come in, they'll be in the pond maybe 10 days, two weeks. And in that time, uh, males are gonna be vying for them and they choose the male most of the time. And then they choose the oviposition site. Uh, they, they, uh, some stimulus causes them to start uh, ovipositing, releasing the eggs and the males uh, from the back uh, rain sperm over them, essentially ejaculate sperm over them as they're pushed out. And he primarily guides the uh, eggs to a spot, but she's cho chosen the attachment point. So she chooses what the eggs will be attached to. Um, but that is the function of those, those pads and those beefy forearms. So you can still also see on the right-hand side, you have a little quite different view. You don't see the thumbs because they're actually pushed way up on the pecs here and she, he's grabbing on for dear life. To me, this is a beautiful sight. Um, males arrive first, and because it's explosive, their fitness really depends upon them passing on their genes, and sometimes they get a little bit over desperate, and they get it a little bit wrong, or a lot bit wrong, and uh, uh, my co-host here has written extensively on this topic. Um, so let's go clockwise. We'll start with the one on the upper left, and that is a, uh, a very uh, keen California red-legged frog male amplexing a Western toad. It's not gonna work. 
sorry to say, it's just really not going to work. Now, if the same thing goes on with conspecifics, as is going on on the right-hand side, so it looks fine, the one on the right-hand side, except it's not so uh, impassioned to an embrace. Uh, and, the, and the reason for that is, uh, look how beefy these arms are. You can't really see the nuptial pads, but you can see that that's a male. And oops, so is that. So, um, and also a very beefy forearm. So within species, they have a mechanism to stop this. So the males actually have a release call. Females have it too, but the males use it when another male grabs them because in the melee, in the desperation to pass on their genetic material, they pretty much grab anything that's slippery and gooey um, <laughs> or however you want to describe the texture of a frog. Uh, if it moves and it feels like a frog, they grab it. And so, but in the case of conspecifics, it, they, have, they have it worked out. So this one released the other one, all is good. On the left-hand side, uh, part of the reason that this is a dangerous thing uh, for the toad and for the frog is that they could go through the whole breeding season like this, and toads are more explosive than frogs are, they could go through the whole breeding season like this, and because they got it wrong, they don't pass on their genes. If they die before the next breeding season, they have lived for no purpose. So that's why this is kind of called, a, people call it an evolutionary or a reproductive sink. Uh, and then on the lower left, I know they're not California red legged frogs, but for the cute factor and for the unusual factor, and we've seen this twice. Um, yes, indeed, the male on the right tried it on with the female toad. Uh, and again, it did not work. And of course, he was in full amplexus on her back when I first saw him, but I had a movie camera that wasn't working. So I ran back to the car when I came back, you know, they were kissing, but they weren't doing anything. So unfortunately, I missed the moment. Um, but sometimes, and we see this with toads also, the male and the female somehow encounter outside the pond while she and he are on the way to breeding and he just hitches a ride. And she may or may not keep him there. I really don't know. Um, none of us has ever really followed this to conclusion, but chances are, you know, he got lucky early on and he's not gonna really have any competition. Uh, it's gotta be quite a burden for the female, I would think. But anyway, sometimes these things happen. But the most important thing to understand is that there's a there's a real, real drive to reproduce. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit detrimental to them during the reproductive season because they do things that um, uh, perhaps in haste, you might say. One second, Jeff. Yep. Angel has a question. Go ahead, Angel. Um, how many egg masses can California red-legged frog lay in a season? That's an excellent question. So any of the any of the frogs in the Ronidae, as far as we know, one per season. And uh, getting back to the competition between them and bullfrogs, which we sort of hinted at, we now know for certain that bullfrogs can have at least two. And since they lay two, now they're probably not the same size, but when you add even half of that to 20,000, as opposed to 2,000 to 4,000 for a red-legged frog, uh, what they call the propagule pressure. So uh, just flooding the environment with young, uh, bullfrogs have the advantage hands down. Uh, the red arrow just popped up to show you that uh, they're both males. So where do they oviposit? Where do they put eggs? Now, so what's interesting about this photograph is you can't tell because I didn't use the same uh, framing, but the pond on the, on the top left is the same as the pond on the lower left just uh, about probably eight years intervening and a change in grazing practices. But the egg mass to the right of the, of the uh, upper photograph, the one that's attached to grasses, is what they do when there isn't any other emergent vegetation. So what happens is the, the fall or winter rains bring the pond level up and uh, they germinate annual grasses that are in the mud or on the shore. And so those grasses grow up and for a short time, they have pretty good structure and that's enough for the females to lay their eggs on. So they attach to almost anything. They'll attach to, I think Jeff's recorded uh, cow pies, dried of course, um, rocks, logs, uh, all kinds of things, but it's usually aquatic vegetation. And later on, I think we'll see where they just attach to the muddy bottom. So that's not ideal, but sometimes they'll do that. Uh, but even in marginal vegetation, we don't get as many egg masses 
but we still get reproduction in an absolutely hammered environment like the one on the upper left. But then eight years later, because we, we grew, we stopped uh, grazing year round and we stopped this, the grazing style, aquatic vegetation came in. Now, we almost always find egg masses attached, as you see in the, in the photograph to the right, underwater within, usually with easily close to within a meter of the surface uh, and attached to aquatic vegetation like these tulies. Um, and then if you look closely, you can see this little hand waving at you right here. It's actually a newt on that stalk and it's probably eating the red-legged frog eggs. Um, we didn't have proof in that situation, but we got unfortunate real proof later on. And then this is a contrast between fresh eggs and old eggs. So I described the process of them taking on water and expanding out and becoming these nice clear capsules with a beautiful um, uh, ova inside. Beautiful if you're a frog person. Sorry, I think they're gorgeous. Um, and all these white tips are probably the vegetal, pole, vegetal poles, right where the sperm just went in because they're freshly fertilized, these little points on the, on the eggs. So this one's freshly fertilized. Um, and then this one is about probably 10 days to two weeks old. And you can see that it's started to collect uh, a lot of debris and then a lot of algae on the outside. Uh, and sometimes this little red guy is probably a copepod, I'm guessing. Anyway, so little microorganisms are always associated with them. Um, oh, this is that same picture, just enlarged. Sometimes we get places where a lot of females aggregate and we get multiple egg masses. So it's hard to tell from this, but that's an individual egg mass. This is an individual egg mass. And then there's one behind over here like that. And they're all pretty much the same age. You can tell by the shape of the embryos. So they're kind of banana shaped, which means these are quite advanced now. Um, so similar age, but all clustered together. And who knows if the frogs are related? These are, these are things we don't know. Uh, Jeff Alvarez has a publication out with a lot of his peers uh, regarding where oviposition takes place generally. They usually oviposit within a meter of the edge of, the, of, a, of a pond. Um, sometimes deeper, but not very often, usually within a meter of the edge. And Jeff, I don't remember what the depth was on your paper. Was it like 10 centimeters? Yeah, within about half a meter. Half a meter, okay. Yeah, and there are, there are some exceptions, but those, that's really pretty much the general rule. And then so, so we've said that they'll lay any time between November uh, and April. Normally we see them between January and March here, but on the coast where it's warmer and the seasons are less defined, they'll often get them in November, December. Up here, the earliest we've had is the first week of January. Um, and as late as the last week of March, but that was in the drought time. And that this is the next sort of the next feature. So this is 2021, the peak of the drought. Um, two of our ponds never even filled up completely. In fact, one of them only got to about a third full. Um, and the frogs delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And we only got a fraction of the normal number. And then they laid in really shallow water and they attached apparently just to the mud. Um, Maybe the algae attached to the mud, I'm not sure, um, because you really have to remove the egg mass to tell, and we weren't going to do that. Uh, but within 10 days, it didn't rain anymore, and that's what happened to the egg mass. So the arrow points to the right. It actually dehydrated and perished. Um, it can happen any other time, too, especially in regulated waters. So if you have a dam where flows are let out, you know, the frogs are laying on the lower left. They're, they're putting their eggs down deep, and though it's not the same egg mass, this is what can happen. So up on the stalk of the tule, you can see eggs stranded high and dry here. And in fact, over the next 10 days, I believe most of that egg mass stranded. A few of them hatched out and you know, sometimes that's enough to pass on genetic material, but uh, they don't lay 2000 to 4000 um, by mistake. It takes a lot of egg masses or excuse me, eggs to actually make an adult frog. Usually, Somewhere between three and 5% of the larvae that hatch out actually make it to metamorphosis and transitioning to the terrestrial stage. And then somewhere around one to 3% of those actually return to breed. So there's a lot of attrition in this lifestyle. And then where to find them. So these are, these are good examples. This, uh, the one on the left-hand side that's circled is under a bunch of debris, but it's attached to Eleocris or spike rush. 
uh, and it's at the deep end of a pond, but it's also on the northwest side. So as the sun streaks across, streaks across, <laughs> as it arcs across the sky, uh, this is giving maximal exposure to the sun. Uh, and then the same thing on the right hand side, this is actually in shallow water. It looks like it's attached to that branch, uh, but it could be Iliacris too, which is the spike brush coming out of the water. But again, this one is slightly in shade, but it's only partially in shade. It's a fairly fresh mass. You can see how dark it is. This one's probably even fresher. Looks like my circle missed it, but it's even fresher because it's darker uh, and the, the, uh, the oval look larger. But anyway, close to shore, normal. And then if you're in wetlands where the water never gets really deep, usually you have to do some wading. Um, Jeff's gonna to explain to you more about protocol surveys because uh, um, wading is often not an accepted practice. But if you wanna see them in a marshland where nothing ever gets more than two feet deep, they're not gonna be close to the edge probably. They're gonna be wherever they're, they get the best sun exposure. So in the right-hand photo, you have an egg mass here and you actually have one here. It's just not as easy to see. And he's actually, the guy on the left is probably looking at nothing. I don't know why that photo's in there. Um, sometimes a grazed area can do you a favor. So the one on the left was not grazed. That wetland was not grazed. It was, it was fenced off. But these are partially fenced off. It's more exaggerated in the one on the lower right. And these are both at Los Vaqueros Reservoir. Actually, this one doesn't have a fence. It doesn't have a fence. But if you get these dominant walls of tule, no sun can get to the eggs and these ponds become less used by frogs. But in the dry season, when a cattle can get at the tules uh, in grazed areas, they'll browse those right down to the ground or brown down to stubble. And then when they flood in, the stubble makes a great place in the sunlight to attach those egg masses. So grazing is actually quite beneficial to egg masses and egg mass and over position sites, I should say. Because most oftentimes you see a little open water in there and they might use that but it's a lot less likely. It's probably too shaded. And then in here, we were getting egg masses all along here and then out over in here also. But this one, I think is partially fenced. This is often how you can treat a pond in a grazed area. It's just fence half of it. Give access to the ponds and have, or cattle on the half side and, and the vegetation on the other side. And then this one looks hopeless, um, especially to me because Azola, uh, which is the plant, and I think I've, who spilled it on my slide, but um, it's the coppery colored plant that's covering the surface. Be hard for me to believe that it, any one of you who's listening hasn't encountered this if, you, if you've been in the field very often. There are other aquatic plants in here kind of confounding things, but primarily it's azola. And the problem with azola is that it grows so thick and so dense in such a, a thick layer, no sunlight gets through. And so what happens is, is it kills off a lot of the aquatic insects that are below because no light gets in to, to, to create um, uh, was my, a biodiversity of, of uh, algal types. And, you know, larvae are, are vegetarians and they're not going to get much off of this. So they don't do well in this environment. Um, fortunately, in this one, the tulis have created kind of a bathtub ring. And so on the leeward side of the wind over here, uh, the wind keeps this azola blown into a corner. And so it opens up during the breeding season. And that's the one place in the pond where we find eggs. So there is a little bit of hope, but um, this pond needs big time maintenance. Ah, and I think it's back to you, Jeff. Anybody have any questions about that? I kind of went over it fast and it's a lot of information. I, I had a question. Yes. Um, so you had mentioned that uh, there's a lot of response just after rainfall events. I don't know if that's particularly uh, seen on the coast. I was curious about uh, snow melt in the Sierra Nevada foothills, if there's a later response and if maybe there's a response to temperature or amounts of dissolved oxygen. That, those are all great questions, and we have no answers to any of them as far as I know. Jeff, do you have anything? I think Jeff's still muted. But as yeah. far as I know, nothing. Now, there's likely a thermal component to it, but we don't know the timing yet because it's been really difficult for us to find actually um, 
egg masses, especially in the Sierra foothills, partially because most of the frogs are in are on private land and it's hard to get access. And partially because at that time of year, even the folks who are local and local biologists don't seem to be able to get the timing right to find the masses, I guess you'd say. And obviously they're happening because we find tadpoles, but we just, uh, it's been very difficult to mobilize a large enough force of people in accessible places to actually determine the conditions under which those frogs lay eggs. Yeah, and I'm going to jump in with the, the following, and that is that uh, we speak a lot about protocols and survey timing, that kind of, those little levels of detail in CRLF2, uh, pr primarily because we have the time to do it. But I'll just say that if you look at the survey protocol, which I'm going to talk about in a minute here, uh, the survey protocol will say if you're going to do surveys for egg masses in the Sierras, they should start after April 15th. From research that I've done in the last couple of years with a few friends of mine, it looks like April 15th would you would miss about 98% of the egg masses. So uh, that turns out the timing of egg masses seems to be similar to the, the timing that we would find in, say, the South Coast Range or North Coast Range, but not necessarily right on the coast. So somewhere around uh, January to about March. But it's going to vary year to year. They don't tend to be so uh, snowmelt focused because they generally are not in the rivers and systems that are uh, directly related to snowmelt flows. So they'll be on side channels or ponds or something else like that. So it, it's highly variable. But the point of my statement is to say, get out there and look and, and tell us what you find because it'll be interesting. And then you've got a question in the uh, chat, Jeff, that says, can you get rid of Azola? Luckily, Jeff's on mute because he's cussing right now. Thank you. That was delicately put. Um, um, I think so. I've never actually tried myself. Uh, there are sprays. And I don't know anything about the sprays, but there are sprays that are uh, available. There are companies who have boats that will come and skim it off for you. And then they put in uh, some kind of cocktail of enzymes, whatever that means, that supposedly keeps them out or keeps it out for a while. Uh, the neighbor had that done and you're talking about a six figure expense. So uh, even if you can get rid of it, it's probably uh, not affordable for most of us. But what you can do is, is try to take advantage of the wind when you get it. So one of the things about Azola is that it really proliferates in protected areas. So the pond I showed you sits in a bowl on the top of the mountain. The wind just goes right over the top. So it's really sheltered from the wind. And then it's further sheltered by the stands of tulies. So, but what you can do is try to open up the leeward end from the tulies, uh, take a heavy machinery and get that stuff out or graze it down so that it's not protruding from the surface. And then the wind will take it during windstorms and rack it on one end. And that tends to open up the pond at least for a while and maybe long enough for the frogs to breed. Uh, but aside from those actions, none of which are simple, um, I don't have an answer for you, sadly. Yeah, I can't add too much to that other than saying we've tried saning it and you can really thin it out for a while, which which does help, but by the time you're out there saying it, you may already have missed a good breeding season. So you, you have to come up with um, a different strategy. And one of the strategies is to uh, essentially reconstruct the pond. So reduce all the nutrients so that Azola doesn't do so well. That just means clean it out, remove the silt, remove a lot of the cattails and effectively you're starting over. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here on protocols and survey techniques. Um, some of this is going to be fairly important to some of you who haven't heard anything about this. Uh, but you know what? Oh, sorry, I just got another question in the chat. Is Azoa native? There are three species. One is native, two are not native. They all get treated the same. They all get treated like they're pests. So native or not, it gets treated like it's a pest. So uh, protocols and survey techniques are um, I, are not as um, strict and, and kind of rigid as you might expect. Um, sorry, I got it distracted, uh, but Frank sent another question in the chat or statement. It says, I've read stuff about 
triploid sterile carp and goldfish being effective measures against it, although the newly introduced fishes can damage egg masses. Also, I think that there has been a beetle or a weevil species that can be used against it. Uh, keep in mind that both goldfish and carp do eat vertebrates. They eat lots and lots of tadpoles. So you're not going to want to use them in a site that has red-legged frogs or potentially yellow-legged frogs or tiger salamanders or anything like that. They will, they will clean house. Yes, they're vegetarians, but that doesn't mean anything. They're just like people who claim to be vegetarians, but then go ahead and eat meat. So uh, just keep in mind that with every action, there's going to be a reaction that you hate. So uh, be very, very careful how you do it and what you do. And then monitor, monitor, monitor. And when you're done, monitor some more. So uh, we always, always, always appreciate your guys' experiences. Uh, we, we want you to chime in with that because we all help each other this way. Uh, so do do that. Feel free. Uh, we're not, uh, it, just because I may not do what you're saying doesn't mean we're trying to beat you up about it. So, uh, oh yeah, Jeff added his own little chat. I'm just going to ignore him because he has the floor most of the time here. And now he's cussing and he's on mute, luckily. Okay, protocols. Ah, uh, see. Okay, so protocols. So if you've not seen a survey protocol, uh, you've probably not done red-legged frog surveys. It doesn't mean anything personal. It just means get on the Fish and Wildlife Service website. Uh, their survey protocols and guidelines uh, page will give you an idea of the kinds of protocols they have. We're going to focus on one, and that's California red-legged frog. And when you get to that category, uh, you'll see complete guidance there. That means site assessment and survey protocol. Those are very different, very important to know the difference and also the order in which you do them. Uh, before I jump away from that, I'm going to just say uh, you do a site assessment first, submit that to the agency, the service, and then they tell you whether to do a protocol survey or not. You don't just go do a protocol survey. So if they say go do one, you go do one. If they say don't do it, then you don't have to do it. But do read the directions before you just decide to go out and start looking for frogs. It's very, very important. Uh, your client will appreciate it. You could probably save them $50,000 by uh, just reading it and knowing what you have to do and what you don't have to do. So uh, broadly speaking, survey protocols um, come from either the service or the CDFW. Uh, they have them for some species. We're going to focus on red-legged frogs, but uh, if they don't have it for the species you're looking for, you can use other kinds of protocols and modify them. You just need to get it approved. So there, there's one that Fellers and Friel did that's sort of a generalized, uh, standardized aquatic amphibian server protocol. There's one that was done by Hayer et al. Uh, that's a book that I think is good to have for those who uh, need it. They have a Spanish version, which I think it's fantastic because my colleagues in Mexico uh, really, they speak English perfectly well, but this is a big benefit because the details can get missed. And then if you're still missing out, uh, the service has a protocol on how to develop a protocol. Let me just warn you in advance that this is a maybe a five to 10 year process. If you want to develop a protocol, you're going to get thousands and thousands and thousands of comments on the protocol you're putting together. They're going to expect you to write it all for free, uh, and then they're going to criticize it until you get tired of redoing it. And, and this is also you can go do a survey on something that doesn't have a protocol. So just be a little bit um, wary of where you want to go. This, this can be quite a rabbit hole. So if you don't work out of the Sacramento area, you work maybe uh, down in Santa Barbara County or somewhere even further south, uh, the Ventura office has their own survey protocols and they can be different. So be aware of that and you want to read the protocol for your that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service field office. In this case, they have a foothill yellow red-legged frog uh, survey protocol. Uh, you want to read it beginning to end because even though it may start out sounding just like the Sacramento field office uh, survey protocol, it may be slightly different and you should know that before you start because if you don't, they're going to reject your surveys um, out of hand and you'll have to start over. And then also keep in mind, because we're going to talk about this too, they do have a protocol for cleaning your gear, cleaning your waders, uh, that sort of thing, so that you don't get involved in transmitting things like chytrid or ranavirus or other things. 
So uh, here's the guidelines for site assessments and field surveys for red-legged frogs. It was written in 2005. I've been part of the process of uh, updating this. Uh, it's been really clunky for lots of years because people come and go in the service. And so here it is 2022 and it hasn't been updated yet. And the only person working on the update right now is me. Uh, Jeff is helping out too, but I haven't even given him one draft yet because it's been such a mess. So. Uh, it's still the same protocol that it has been. 2005 is unchanged. There are things in here that do not work that are do, that you cannot do. Uh, that's why we're trying to update it. But uh, to, to get this modified, you're going to have to get it approved before you start your survey. Before you start it. Not after, not during, before. So one of the things that's going to ask you to do is do field surveys. So uh, let's just say you've done your site assessment. They say, yeah, go out and do sur surveys. You, you go buy a few nets and you get your waders and you go out and you start scooping around because you think, oh, that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to see what's in there. Uh, but no, they don't want you in the pond at all. The survey should be on the bank, walking around the edge, looking for animals. And if you find one animal, you have a positive observation. It's going to be on occupied site. You're good to go. Uh, you don't have to keep doing surveys. Now, the survey protocol will allow you to do eight surveys. Your client will appreciate it if you stop when you get one frog because all of the results will be the same occupied site mitigation so uh these little circles will slash through it mean don't get in the water don't go dip netting don't go looking around for stuff because if you don't have a federal permit to do this you can get into a boatload of trouble so stay on the bank walk around doing your surveys visually you don't need a permit for that you don't need a state permit you don't need a, a federal permit you just need some feet and uh, maybe some binoculars and a hat, and that's all you need. So I just threw this up there kind of probably to be more irritating than anything, but uh, you don't need to read all this. You don't need to memorize it. I'm just showing you that on the uh, left, the left column with the species is California red-legged frog. If you go to the right, I put in California tiger salamander, arroyo toad, and other species in sort of quote fingers. Uh, this is partly because most of the people that come to our workshops are consultants. And one of the things that I notice right away is that consultants try to, uh, they think they're an insurance company and they want to bundle all this stuff together. It doesn't work very well at all. So you can't do a red-legged frog survey and a tiger salamander survey and say an arroyo toad and a turtle survey all at the same time and get all this done and feel like, yeah, we bid 100,000, but we, you know, we got it done for 90, so we came in under budget. This is all going to cost you, you know, $300,000 to do all of these because each one has to be done at a different time of year with a different number of surveys, different number of visits, different skill set, whether or not you may need a federal permit. All these things are different. So I won't go through each one, but I'll just share with you. Red-legged frog requires up to eight surveys, up to eight. That means if you get a red-legged frog, you don't have to do any more, uh, but you have to do up to eight. Uh, surveys may be during the day, maybe night, um, and this just depends on how many surveys you're doing. You, you um, have to do surveys outside of the area that you're supposed to be surveying, so a big buffer zone. Uh, you, you have to uh, notify the service. I'm just going to jump through some of these. Your survey season is between January and September. Uh, there are several days between surveys. Uh, if we could just go down the list, there's uh, minimum qualifications, even though I misspelled that. Um, you do not need a recovery permit for red-legged frog, like I said in the previous slide, uh, but you do need to notify the agencies. Uh, the red-legged frog does have an expiration. So two years after you started your first survey day, it will expire. So keep that part in mind. If I just jump over and just kind of stay very general, you can see uh, you might have 20 to uh, maybe 150 survey days for California tiger salamander, Royo toad, maybe six or so. Uh, the windows for survey are very, very different. Uh, you almost completely miss tiger salamander survey window when you're doing red-legged frog window and uh, Royo toad, maybe you could uh, bundle that in with red-legged frog, but they're in different habitats. So you don't wanna be doing all this stuff uh, together. You don't wanna propose that you can do all these species together, even if you're in a spot that they all co-occur. 
Now, Turtle is probably going to be listed in 2023. There's probably going to be a survey protocol that comes out, although we don't know what that looks like yet. Nobody's tried to even start that. Uh, but it's also going to just kind of throw all this into a mess because these species can co-occur. So uh, Jeff and I and a few others wrote a paper on California tiger salamander and red-legged frog co-occurring. So if you have a permit for red-legged frog and you're dip netting, but you don't have one for tiger salamander and you catch tiger salamander, you have to immediately stop, notify the agencies, and then apply for that permit if you want to continue. So keep in mind that some of the stuff can get complicated very, very quickly. Just know your stuff, read the protocols, each one that might impact you, and follow those because they're considered rules. Decontamination, this is sort of a yawner. You know, most people just think, well, I'll deal with it if I have to, or I'll deal with it at the workshop. But, you know, lots of people don't do this stuff. We know it as a fact, but we need to teach you this. We need to help have you consider this a very important part of the survey protocol. It is going to be written into your permit if you get a permit. It's always written into like an LSAA or a BO or an HCP these days. So all this matters. So you're going to need to know what it's about. So the general point to decontaminate against diseases for amphibians is to avoid chytrid in red-legged frogs, but other species of frogs. Uh, there's a new type of chytrid that occurs in salamanders, although it's not in California yet. Ranavirus might be another thing. Red-legged disease, which is a bacteria, but causes uh, frogs to have red legs. Uh, trematodes, lots of parasites, it turns out. Jeff knows so much more about that than I do, but a lot of these things aren't going to help you with some of these um, some of these parasites, but you don't want to be moving parasites around pond to pond, so you just want to be aware that you can be doing that kind of thing. Uh, Jeff will talk about parasites in the field because we always run into some. One that, she, that Jeff and I run into frequently are leeches. You find leeches on red legs, on yellow legs, on toads, on everybody. So if you don't like leeches, you're in a little bit of trouble because we're probably going to see a few. So this is sticking with the decontamination protocol. If you haven't figured it out already, you can look up this stuff online. Uh, the Water Board has uh, a web page that has decontamination protocols. It's way down here on the bottom, but you still can find it. So uh, look up theirs if that's the one you need to use. Uh, PARC, so this is uh, Partners for Amphibian Reptile Conservation has their own. It's very, very similar, but this version tells you how to do it in the field. Uh, it's a, it, it can, be modified in some ways, but you have to make sure that it's effective. So uh, it being effective is the is the critical point here, and we'll talk about uh, how that changes with what you use. So uh, here's one for national parks. So the National Park Service has their own version, but this is generally the federal level decontamination protocol, which will be written into your permit if you get one. So we'll follow this along just to see how it goes. So if you get down to the nitty gritty, they have preferred and alternative methods. Here's the preferred. So the preferred is to use quat, which is a, kind of a hospital grade disinfectant. Uh, they want you to create a solution to 0.001. I'm uh, sorry, 0 0.01. Uh, the solution to get to that level is about a quarter of an ounce. Generally, that is one pump of your bottle. You'll see uh, that in the field with us uh, per gallon. And then uh, you get that to the appropriate level of concentration and uh, you do a rinse and we'll show you how to do that. Uh, specifically about this, quark comes in uh, 128, which is a concentrated level, and 64, which is half concentrate. So you have to know which bottle you have in terms of how much of the concentration you need to create. So if you have 128, which is what we usually use, use a quarter of an ounce. If you have 64, you use a half an ounce, but you need to know the difference when you're buying it. Um, so uh, we can help you figure out where to buy it when you get it. Uh, we know that the, this level of dilution can have impact on amphibians in the laboratory, but it hasn't been proven to occur in the field. So it is uh, the preferred method at this point. So this is what it looks like if you buy it from like Smart and Final or maybe Amazon or somewhere. It costs about, if if I remember right, somewhere around $15 to $20 for one gallon. I've had my one gallon for 15 years. So you don't use very much. It goes very slow. It does uh, sort of keep. I mean, it does, um, it, it's got a long shelf life. So 
I'm probably going to get rid of mine at some point and just get a new bottle because my bottle's starting to break down. Here's the alternative. So this is option B. Uh, fresh, and I highlight that in red, fresh household bleach. So it has to be fresh because once you take the lid off the bottle of bleach, it starts to degrade and the concentration decreases quickly. So you want a 5% solution for bleach. Uh, and you mix that with water. Generally, that's about a 1 to 20 solution. And uh, if you get that right, you'll know it because you can smell the bleach. Uh, it'll, it will definitely stain your clothes. It'll stain your waders. It'll help break down your waders over time. Uh, just keep in mind that this is probably the typical one you're going to use because you're going to forget that you have to disinfect until the last minute. You're going to stop by, uh, you know, who knows where, Rayleigh's or Vaughn's or wherever, and you're going to find that they don't have quat, so you're going to buy bleach, and you need to make a 5% solution and use that in the field. The nice thing about bleach is you can pour it onto a asphalt road or the sidewalk, and it'll dissipate very quickly. The bleach just evaporates, and that's an easy way to get rid of it if you're out in a remote area. You don't want to dump it into the creek or pond or anywhere near it. If you're going to do that, you're going to have to figure out what site you're on because Forest Service has protocols for how you dispose of this. You might have to pack some of this out. Uh, you got to figure that out before you go. So uh, you do need to keep in mind, though, that uh, bleach breaks down quickly, so you have to have a fresh bottle every time. If uh, you break open your bottle, use it for your disinfecting. Uh, use the rest of it for your laundry because it's not going to be good for disinfecting. So here's what bleach comes in. Uh, obviously, I mean, maybe not everybody does their own laundry still. Uh, but you can buy bleach in a gallon or a half gallon or even a quart. Uh, you can get these bleach crystals, but you're going to actually have to figure out what the concentration is to get to 5%. These also come with uh, scents and additives and buffers and things that you may not want to put onto your waders or into the environment. But I've seen people use it, so keep that in mind that if you're going to do that, you're going to have to figure it out before you go. Don't be trying to stand on the side of the road trying to figure this out. It's not going to work very well. So the system we've come up with is just to get some tubs from Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever you shop, uh, fill it with five gallons worth of water, get the concentration level at the rate you're supposed to for using either quad or bleach, step into it, make sure you step into it, uh, use some method, we use brushes, but you can use a tub or a bucket or something to get the solution all the way up to your thighs at the very least. Uh, and then also remember to uh, rinse through and decontaminate your nets. Uh, this is my friend Dave Cook. He has nets with wooden handles. We know the wood can hold on to chytrid, so make sure you do all the way up the handle. You can see the handles are wet. Uh, Jeff and I use fiberglass handles, so we don't worry about it so much, but all these things need to be disinfected, including your buckets, your trays, your rulers, your hand nets. Everything that's going to go into the water should be disinfected. And we'll go through this procedure with you in the field. We assume people come uh, to these workshops with Kitrid, so we're going to treat everybody the same unless you have brand new, you know, rubber smelling, uh, mineral oil covered waders coming out of the box. Uh, if, if you have that, then yeah, you're going to be good. Outside of that, you're going to be getting into the disinfection tub. So if you look to the left, this is uh, disinfected and bleach over the course of a few seasons. Uh, your waders break down, they crack very easily, they get definitely get stained. Uh, the one uh, on the left photo, but on the left side of it is a non-disinfected waiter. On the right is a bleach disinfected waiter after a few seasons. Uh, they don't last very long. This is typical uh, for even a one full season if you disinfect more than about 10 times, so keep that in mind. And then I put this other photo in there because this is sort of the nature of life itself. So uh, some folks were driving to their site. They got a reminder text that said, hey, make sure you disinfect before you get into the aquatic water body. They stopped at a 7-Eleven, which didn't carry quad, obviously, didn't have bleach, but they did have pine saw. And it said on the label, it's a disinfectant, so why not use it, right? Well, this is what it did to the waiters before they even got into the water. So a whole day of travel wasted for people who are not prepared. Do not use anything except what you are permitted to do, that is quat or bleach. Yes, you can use alcohol, 95% uh, and even 70% uh, alcohol, ethyl alcohol, but if it doesn't say you can on your permit, you can't do it. It is, um, it's an effective disinfectant, but it has to be on your permit for you to use it. 
so uh, there is also this thing about minimum qualifications. So minimum qualifications are different depending on what region you're in. So you want to make sure you know what region you're in in terms of what qualifications you're going to need. And then the qualifications change enough to make a difference. So the qualifications for red-legged frog used to be 20 animals handled. Some of them had to be larvae, some had to be adults, and some had to be metamorph or a juvenile life stage, and 30 hours in the field with permitted people. It's changed more recently, and you just have to look up the minimum qualifications on the web to find out what these are, those are. And uh, here they are for red-legged frog. Now, I don't want you to memorize this. I, I'll decipher this in a second here. But they're very specific, so read these because you're going to need them if you're going to try to apply for a permit. So instead of reading through this or snapping a photo of it with your camera, here's, here's the gist. So uh, you need 30 hours worth of permitted biologist. I'm going to slow down here because this is an important piece of information. If you have 300 hours working under a biological opinion and have handled 2,000 red-legged frogs, that counts for zero. You need 30 hours with a permitted biologist. So unless you have a permitted biologist working with you, whose permit number you've gotten, that all those hours you've done, all those handles you've done, how expert you may feel is all for nothing because it's a zero. You have to be with a permitted biologist. Jeff and I are both permitted, so you're going to be good there. You won't be spending 30 hours with us, but you'll see why that doesn't matter anyway. Uh, you have to do this during three different events. That means you can't go out one or two days in a row and do two 15 hour days over a long weekend and get all your 30 hours in. They want you to be in three different events with different sites, different areas, presumably different counties, uh, ideally with a different permitted biologist, but not always, but they like it that way. So now you only have to handle at least two adults and five larvae. That's it, seven animals, but that's the minimum. The minimum isn't what they want. It's the minimum. If you want to sue them, you can get away with the minimum. Nobody's going to sue them. So you need to be thinking about 20 to 30 animals that include adults, that include larvae, include metamorphs or juveniles. So think something like 20 to 30 on your list. You have to also have to observe one egg mass with a permitted biologist, all this with permitted biologists. So uh, when they, they give you all this restriction, then they give back a little. So four hours can come from, it shouldn't say form, it should say from survey efforts that don't produce anything. So uh, th by that, I mean like a dead survey. So you go out and you survey for eight hours in, I don't know where, Fresno County on the uh, west side of the Central Valley, and you don't get any red-legged frogs. And you do that for eight times. So you have, let's just say you have, 64 hours doing surveys and got zero. Four of those, as long as they're with a permitted biologist, can count toward your 30 hours. But only four of them if you got zero frogs. Every other hour has to have uh, occupied habitat with permitted biologists. And four from can come from a level one workshop. So we're going to provide you that. We're going to give you at least five or six hours, probably even a lot more than that. Uh, four of them count for level one. That's mostly because most level ones have 30 people in the field with one permitted biologist. The way Jeff and I do it is uh, we're going to have six people per permitted biologist. So generally speaking, the service sees that as a one-to-one -one ratio, and you generally would be able to take every hour we give you and use those in favor of your 30 hours. But at level one workshop level, they only want to give you four. They want you to get away from the workshop and go get some more hours with somebody else. Now, people always ask, well, you do a level two workshop. Do those hours count? Yes, they count because we do it very differently and we've had it all approved with the agencies. Another qualification is you have to know how to decontaminate. It's going to be an expectation of being your permit. It'll be important for you to know. Uh, you'll also have to know all this other stuff that they're not putting in the minimum qualifications, which means things like St. Patrick species. St. Patrick re rare, threatened, and endangered species. You're going to have to know vocalizations. You're going to have to know the seasonality of the animal. So getting through one level one workshop really is really the bare minimum you need to know, but you also need a level one workshop to get a permit. Now, it's not written in here, but they're going to make you do it anyway. So 
keep in mind that there are minimum qualifications. They want a lot more than the minimum. So just do the best you can, but get your permitted biologist permit number. If you can't get it, ask us. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the field. So finally, we're gonna take a little bit of a break. We'll take about 10 minutes. Um, I gotta look back here at my own clock. It's 10.40. Uh, we'll go uh, have a break for, in, for 10 minutes for about, until about 11.50, we'll start up again. Jeff will start us off. Uh, I'll hang out here. Jeff is probably gonna hang out here. We can ask, you can ask him. We can answer more questions. And then just remember that we'll be around in the field for you as well. So I see one hand raised, go ahead. Uh, so will we be decontaminating before we get started? Um, like say we're, uh, I'm going tomorrow, should I go get some quat right now and get my waders or uh, will we be doing that in the field? We'll definitely do that in the field. We'll show you how to do it. We'll provide all of the, the, the bin, the quat, the water, the brushes, every single thing you need will provide except the waders. So you bring your waders and if they're not coming brand new out of a box, we're going to have you decontaminate. So we'll show you how to do that. Cool. Thanks. Angel? Hey, Jeff. Uh, I just had a question about what other, what other um, things have you seen people use a, let's say, a California red-legged frog permit? Um, I'm just curious. Like, what do they use the permit for? Yeah, like uh other than um let's say for an environmental consulting firm like have you seen uh, other people um acquire a permit and if so what have you seen or what have you seen them use the permit for so it's a really good question the permit is actually for doing research or something similar that will promote the recovery of the animal so it's not really for consulting, but consulting uses it primarily to show clients and potential clients that their people are qualified. People use their permit to get qualified for a project. For example, an agency may say, you have to be a designated biologist with these qualifications to work on this project. And so your permit kind of leapfrogs you, so to speak, over all the, you know, all of the need to call people and to uh, check your resume and ask questions and things. So you, you kind of get to the top of the list for that. We certainly know in the grand scheme of things, people use their permits to negotiate a higher hourly rate. I've seen up to $5 more an hour if you have a permit. Certainly um, if people apply to my company, uh, they come in with a PhD and you know 10 years experience, but somebody else comes in from a junior college with a permit I'm going to hire the permitted person. So there, there are some pluses to it, but the agency will tell you that it's for the recovery of the animal. And because we, you can do surveys without a permit, it's not necessary to have it just to do surveys. It's really necessary to have it if you want to handle the frog in any manner at all. Uh, but many projects will have their own permits, so you don't necessarily need it for that. But we do have a section on permitting um, that we'll do after the break, and I'll talk a little bit more about those details too. But it's always a good question. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. Je Jeff Wilcox, um, Angel, who I was just answering the question to, came to Baja last year. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So he's got a lot of good experience already. <laughs> I agree. <clears throat> Most importantly, he knows and loves. Annie and Jorge. <laughs> Hopefully, you better say he does. Them, loves them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, he's out. <laughs> Jeff, I'm going to run and grab a glass of water. And I'm going to, yeah, I'm running. <laughs>
Hey, Jeff, I wanted to ask a question about disinfectant. Yeah, feel free. Um, so I have been using something called Cell Block 64, which has a lot of the same ingredients as Quat, but I'm looking it up right now and it looks like there's three fragrance ingredients that you probably wouldn't want to use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that becomes part of the problem. So the service will say that if it has anything that is not in Quat or not in bleach, then they don't want it. But the problem is that you can buy bleach with lots of fragrance too. So you have to be a little bit careful and kind of, you know, make a professional judgment about it, but you, you really do need to consider what you're taking into an aquatic system, especially if you're going to be like us, where we take in, you know, 12 people a week for three weeks, we're going to be um, introducing a lot of crap into the water that we normally wouldn't want to do. So uh, we go with Quat, we'll definitely rinse it off too. Uh, but you, you do have to consider those things. And certainly your permit, if you get one, will say only quat and or, or only bleach. They w It won't even say alcohol. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Good to know. So I got a, a question on the chat from Shane, who is asking about any specific field gear recommendations. Um, with waders, it, it really is up to your budget because you can buy something from Big Five for 30 bucks. It's going to last one night. Or you can buy Sims waders that are going to be $300 and last you, you know, as long as it takes you to go through blackberries. Uh, but generally what you want is um, for this particular workshop, the water is not going to be very deep. If you had hip waders, that's fine. Old, any kind of waders are going to be good. If you can't do that, even rubber boots would be a benefit. We're going to bring everything to the bank or shoreline so you'll be able to see it. We do uh, highly, highly recommend rubber uh, sold bottoms, whether they are attached boots or separate boots. Uh, felt is going to be outlawed in California. It was supposed to be in February 2022, but they moved it to February 2023 because it carries chytrid. Um, it just is like a nice house for chytrid. So uh, felt bottom is not so good. Felt bottom is really great on our foothill yellow legged frog workshop where we were all slipping on our butts. Uh, felt is fantastic for rocks and slippery algae. We're going to be in mud. And, and really, quite frankly, pretty shallow water in a drying creek that's pretty narrow. So uh, I'll probably wear my own hip waders and I think we'll be fine. Jeff and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the expectations of the field trip at, um, sorry, just looking back at the clock here, uh, at the end of the talk, just so you guys have some idea and to remind you to bring certain things like food, water, hat, this sort of thing. Um, and it, this is, the field portion is certainly more, more, the more exciting portion of this workshop, obviously. I mean, it is for us as well. Uh, and I can easily kind of fall into talking about it right now, but I want to make sure everybody's back from the break and we get started and stay on time. And then at the end, we'll talk about that piece. Uh, we know you're going to be coming in three different groups and we want everybody to hear it. So Mahmoud put up that he likes the Frog Togs Classic. Um, I think those are pretty common. Those are some that we see on almost every workshop. They're easy to get. If you haven't purchased them for tomorrow, you're probably in a ton of trouble. But uh, if you need them for the following Tuesday or the third Tuesday, you're going to be perfectly fine. They'll get them to you in time. If you don't have them for tomorrow, at least bring some uh, rubber boots. So Frank's going to bring felt sold waders, no problem, but just be aware, Frank, that once they get clogged with mud, you're going to be slipping like you're on a layer of fat and ice. But it'll be fine for us because uh, Jeff and I like watching everybody move around and uh, somebody's <laughs> going to somebody's going to hit the mud for sure. Oh, yeah. So I think we're about to get started here again. Jeff's going to share his screen and um, start talking about um, my other screen went blank. So it's I personal. don't know. Ah, of course. I knew that. <clears throat> so whenever you're ready, Jeff. Okay. I hope everybody's back. Um, dispersal is something we're still very much learning about in red-legged frogs. And um, I haven't updated this. Uh, portion of the lecture, but 
I'm going to give you a few updates only because I've had two master's students working here over the last year. Uh, and some of the things that they found in their studies have really lent to uh, our knowledge of dispersal, but uh, those things are still, well, one of them is still being written as a thesis, so none of them have hit publication yet. So I'm, I'm not going to give too many details, but I think um, I can slip in a few things that might really open your mind to the way uh, or, or to ways to understand how frogs move. And um, they're kind of sensical, so hopefully, hopefully it'll make sense to you. Uh, but in dispersal, ecologists talk about three different kinds of movements. This is up for debate, but uh, since this is kind of the current uh, accepted version, I will, I will present this part. But movement to and away from a breeding site. Jeff, are you sharing so, your screen? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's... Do you have me? No. Oh, okay. Does yeah. anybody have uh -huh. Jeff? No. Everybody has Jeff? Oh, no, I don't have. Okay. How do we do this then? Last view, screen. Okay. That's not helping me. I think this happened to us last time also. <laughs> I think I might just be in PowerPoint only. Hang on a second. And so no results there. Yeah, I think I'm just in PowerPoint. Sorry. Let's get back to the Zoom. Okay. And share. Ah, screen sharing has failed to start. Oh. Okay. Hang on a second. Going to try it again. I might have to start over. Did that help? There it is. It's yep, coming up. It says Great. I'm screen sharing. Okay. Great. So now I'm not quite sure where I am. Let me see here. <laughs> Maybe you could start over if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Oh, yeah, because on my picture. Ah, okay. Sorry, I think I'm getting there. Sorry, everyone. Um, I have other things open, and so it's kind of confusing. Um, hey, we're the priority here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you are always meant to be. That helps. <laughs> I think uh, one screen before that, Jeff. Uh, mine is dispersal. Oh yeah, yeah. Are you you're right? You're right. Okay. Got okay. It. Sorry. Thank All you. right. Reiterate really quickly. Dispersal. Um, <laughs> sorry. Movement to and away from the breeding site. So we spoke earlier about um, explosive breeders and how some frogs are going to be at the pond early and some frogs are not going to be. So males arrive early, females arrive later. Uh, this is something that they do every year, although we do have resident frogs in some ponds, mostly those are male. And so we're learning that through studies here. Um, and the females usually leave to some remote place because they have the responsibility of provisioning an egg mass. So they have to eat a lot more food than a male. They also get bigger than males, so they have a little bit more maintenance. But the point is, is that they leave during the non-breeding and they return during the breeding time if they are coming back to um, the pond where they were born or at the pond where they have settled. So then young of the year froglets that have meta transitioned from larvae to metamorphs, uh, as soon as the rainy season starts, usually they move away from the site where they were born and they go to some other remote site in order to get large enough to return to breed. I'm simplifying things because this is the basic plan uh, there are all kinds of uh, alternatives. And then genetically, there's dispersal also. So it's a one-way movement to a distant location. So you're taking your genes and your genetics from one pond and relocating elsewhere. And you might then become uh, uh, dedicated to that pond, or you might return from there to your breeding pond. But if you just go and stay, you've taken your genetics and left the party. One of the ways uh, that we use, or sorry, one of the tools that we use to measure dispersal is we can track the movement of frogs through the use of radio telemetry. And I actually have a little radio right here. You can probably see this is the radio itself. It's uh, coated in epoxy and it has a unique number. Uh, and the size of the radio really is dictated by the length of the battery. So this battery will last 20 weeks. I have a smaller version that lasts 11 weeks, and you can get these that last three weeks. 
Uh, the three week ones weigh a third of an ounce. This one weighs 1.6 ounces. Uh, and then the antenna helps to send the signal off of this. It's battery operated. Uh, there's a switch inside that's controlled by a magnet. You take the magnet off and then it's activated. And then you use a receiver to listen for it. And it has a, can you hear that? No, you can't. Okay, never mind. Anyway, hopefully it works. We'll show you when you get here. But uh, each radio has a unique uh, band. So it's like driving in your car and tuning into your favorite radio station. So each one is like that. Comes through the receiver, we can hear the radio. Uh, and it's attached to the frog, in this case, by a, a aluminum chain belt around the waist. This is a frog that Jeff put a transmitter on in Mexico. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then if we're within 200 meters of the frog, we can pick up a signal. If it goes outside that range, then we have to go locate it elsewhere if we can find it again. But within 200 meters, we can track the frog. And you can track them so closely that you can actually find each individual once you get good enough. Um, but this is the regular, or this is the basic tool we use. We also accompany each or each transmitter, uh, and every actually every frog we catch on the ranch gets a pit tag, a passive integrated transponder. Um, I don't think I have any photos of that, but we'll probably do something that like that while we while you're here. But that gives each frog a unique number. The difference between a pit tag and a radio is with the pit tag, I have to catch the frog and scan it with a scanner to understand who, which frog I have. But I don't have to do that. I can do that remotely with telemetry and I don't have to find the frog to know where it is, but we do fry or find the frog on occasion just to check the health of it, make sure the belt isn't cutting into it. Telemetry is, um, is not, uh, it's not an easy tool to use. It looks great, it's cool technology, but it has to be used properly to get any useful data. Uh, you can see there's a belt around the one on the left and one on the right, uh, the reader is the yellow thing in the bottom left. And you can see how the different belts, we paint them out so that there's not a lot of shine and they're not attractive to predators. Um, and then make sure that they fit nice and loosely. Those are both really beautifully fit because if they're too tight, they'll actually cut through the very sensitive skin of a frog. And then, so this is how you locate. Um, this is uh, Professor Dirk Van Buren at one of the ponds here. And he's holding a Yagi antenna, which is a directional antenna. So it's the, the rear element is actually longer than the front two. And that makes the, it makes the signal focus into the wire that feeds the radio that he's holding up to his ear. And so he just waves the wand around and wherever he gets the strongest signal, that's the direction of the frog. Um, I like this slide also because uh, we said earlier how terrestrial the frog is. And if you look at this slide, you see a white flag here and a white flag here and a yellow flag there and, and uh, flags here, here. Uh, when we did a nocturnal visit to the, to the uh, pond, that's where we found the frogs, not in the water, out of the water. So they spend a lot of time out of the water. Using the locations, we can, tra we can track the frogs across the landscape. This is the result of a study done by Lisa Serber, a master's student who worked here, a master's at Sonoma State. The red dots are red-legged frog locations and the red lines connect the line of travel. Now, it's simplified because we, we, we can only connect the points with straight lines and frogs don't move this way. We, we've learned this over the last year, actually. We suspected it all the time, but we've learned it over the last year. And in this case, Lisa also looked at uh, bullfrogs. So in the middle of the screen is Copeland Creek, and you can see the bullfrogs and red-legged frogs coexisted in Copeland Creek at the time. And then we had some bullfrogs here on the uh, lower right. This is the ranch house that you'll visit tomorrow. Uh, and then bullfrogs went from the ranch house, there's a little spring here, ranch house to this pond. This is Bonnie's pond, we'll visit that tomorrow. That's our main pond that we look at. Um, but they went all the way from the pond all the way down to the creek, some of them. Some of them went away over to a spring here and back and forth. Um, but you get some idea of the lines of travel. Now, this is when we learned these, when we were following maybe once a week. The last winter we followed every single day. And we learned actually that the movements aren't these straight lines. The movements are out and down the creek 
and then overland this way or out into the forest and into leaf litter and then over to the creek and then down the creek into a brush dam or a tree fall and then over to a spring. And if they can't make it the whole way, they probably hole up in a gopher hole uh, or then they go down the spring seep and they end up in the creek and then they go this way or they go over here to a different pond and then they cross this huge wet meadow and get to the creek this way. The theme here is moisture. The frogs need to be able to either access moisture or have a way to maintain it in their bodies. And there will be more on that later. So uh, we talked about holes. The frog on the right is a tree frog and it's 200 meters from any water, but this is where they're gonna find the moisture. So they're moving mostly at night, overland mostly at night uh, when the humidity is high. And then during the day, they're taking refuge in a, in a wet place like this or a moist place, place like this. The frog on the left, what the hell kind of frog is that? <clears throat> so we know what it is because it has dorsal lateral folds from the back of the eye all the way down to the back leg. So this is a California red-legged frog. It just happens to be a beautiful red jewel. It also happens to be out at 88 degrees at night in about 20% humidity and about 100 meters from water. So why is it there? Frogs, moisture, right? Frogs need moisture. Well, it turns out that this is a really good sized adult. And the larger the frog is, the easier it has time it has coming out of the cool water where it's lowered its body temperature to maintain the coolness. And it can go out in the heat and it's that cool uh, uh, inertia. The inertia of being cold inside allows them to maintain the cold and maintain moisture even out in a hot environment. But out here, they're gonna find more insects and fewer frogs for competition. So this is probably what they're doing at night out on land. Oh, and then, so these are references that, well, the one in the middle is not a reference yet because we haven't published it yet. But the one on top is really the definitive thing that or the definitive work on what we know about how froglets move after they've metamorphosed. So froglets and metamorpho metamorphs are the same. Uh, neither name is perfect, but uh, basically they've newly transi transitioned from uh, a vegetarian larval stage to now a terrestrial frog stage that's gonna eat insects. The definitive work that most of us go by is from Alabac, um, and that's in her review. And he found that fro frogs leave their natal ponds en masse as soon as the first rain event happens. Uh, and we've seen this. Uh, the next one is gonna be about some different stuff that we've seen also. But as you can see from the next uh, citation, which isn't really a citation yet, but that the, even the little froglets can move a long way in a few days. So the maximum known dispersal distance is 1.6 kilometers over four months. But we learned last winter that they probably moved that distance in a much shorter amount of time. And then the maximum known dispersal distance for adults is 3.6 kilometers. Um, it was a big female in one of the first studies that used telemetry down on the coast uh, near San Luis Obispo. And she actually moved 3.6 kilometers, but she moved between two ponds that were 2.8 kilometers apart. So that lets you know that, that it's not a straight line movement. It took her 3.6 kilometers to travel 2.8. So she's zigzagging all through. And then I think Jeff, it's back to you. All right, let me just get going here. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about listening and status. I'm going to pick up my speed a little only because I see that we're falling a little bit behind in terms of time. But uh, all this stuff we'll go over again in the field. We talk about all this multiple times because we know it's a lot of information. So California red-legged frog, uh, most of us know, is a species of concern with the state of California. Sometimes that gets lost in the fact that it's federally listed and we just ignore the fact that it's only a species of concern to the state. It's a benefit to us because it's a lot less permitting that you have to deal with. So uh, I, I consider that actually a, a plus. But this this listing as species of concern occurred when it was a subspecies, Reina aurora dratonii. Uh, now it's moved to species and the status uh, followed its elevation to species. So uh, that's what I'm pointing out with this little swirl here, really just saying that it went from subspecies to species. 
Uh, and but it, either way you look at it, it's still the same animal. So in 1994, the yellow book on the left was how it got designated or when it got designated in 1994 uh, by Jennings and Hayes. And then uh, Thompson et al. came up with this book, I think in 2015. Uh, on the right, it's a, an updated version, but I would say the one on the left is far superior in terms of information shared uh, details. Yes, the one on the right is updated, but uh, I would just say get both of them. They're both available as PDFs on CDFW's website. So the federal listing came in 1996 through the Federal Register. This is how they let you know that they're going to list something. So uh, it became a threatened species in 1996. And once that happened, then it got a lot of attention. So uh, th this was this is kind of a, a tough way to find things out. You, nobody spends time on the Federal Register that isn't being paid to do so. But if when you cite this, there is actually a form that you cite uh, and a format that you cite, and it's from 1996. So following 1996's listing, in 2002, they came out with their final recovery plan for California red-legged frog. This is still back when they saw it as a subspecies. Uh, if you remember right from the maps, um, Schaefer's uh, differentiation of the two species came far uh, later than 2002. So it's considered a subspecies here, but all the same animal. Then there was the designation of critical habitat in 2010. Uh, this really just defined areas where the federal government would focus its effort and put lots of pressure on mitigation for anything to happen within these areas. It turned out to be an enormous area initially in the draft uh, designation for critical habitat and they got sued and then it became so tiny it's, it's really barely relevant. And again, just to remind you, um, in, 2004, this is when Schaefer came along and elevated it to species. So we're still talking about the same animal, whether it's species or subspecies. And then just to kind of focus on what Schaefer did for a second here, uh, he split all this up genetically. And then what he found was, uh, here's red-legged frog, our red-legged frog circled right in the center of his little chart. Uh, what he determined was it's very closely related to the northern red-legged frog and Cascades frog which uh, turned out um, a little bit of a surprise because I think we assumed it was certainly related to them. They were, they were uh, subspecies initially or even the same species. But then its uh, next closest relative is going to be uh, the mountain, the Sierra Nevada mountain yellow legged frog, uh, Rena muscosa. And what would seem to be a closely related uh, sister taxon is Boilei is not really that closely related. It's actually a bit of a different animal. So uh, he did a lot of good work here that helped us understand the relationships between all these species groups. And again, uh, the, it's more closely related to Cascades and, and Aurora. Somebody asked me earlier if it'd be easy to differentiate. Uh, it's much harder to differentiate between California red-legged frog and Cascades frog. And there's really a very close area where they can be, both be found um, so I would say you're in a little bit of trouble if you're working on a Cascades frog in an area with, where California can also occur. So uh, I'm speeding this up just because I'm trying to keep us um, on, on time, but uh, we can talk a lot about this stuff in the field again. Jeff's going to jump in from here. I'm rambling to give him the floor, and here he goes. And he's on mute cussing away. Jeff, are you off mute yet? Now I am. Okay. I'm about to mutiny is what I'm about. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Teresa, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just since I keep seem to keep wasting time between three, uh, screen switches, uh, but I have photographs up here. Pray for terrestrial frogs. These are uh, a damselfly on the right, a dragonfly on the left, and they are volant prey, so meaning winged prey. And what we learned from a couple of different studies, and there aren't very many, actually, is that um, uh, uh, California red-legged frogs, being terrestrial frogs, eat primarily terrestrial prey. And so um, 
larvae are easy because they're primarily herbivores, but we can't uh, discount the fact that sometimes, probably especially in low water conditions, they will cannibalize other larvae. And so we've had bullfrog larvae eating red-legged frog larvae, red-legged frog larvae cannibalizing, uh, et cetera. So it can happen. It's probably not as common, or I should say it's probably not common because they're primarily set up to eat plant matter. So, uh, but the adults are primarily insectivorous. They will eat small vertebrates. So I think there are a there's a case of uh, certainly of mice uh, and there's a case of a vole that we have actually seen that recently here. Um, but they too will eat uh, anything that they can fit in their mouth. So if you got a little froglet or a metamorph red-legged frog and a big red-legged frog finds it, down the hatch it goes. So we don't put them in buckets together for that reason. Uh, they're only gape limited. That means that anything that they can fit down their mouth, they will fit down their mouth because they're predators and that's what they do. Hayes and Tennant in uh, 1985 did the first real diet study. They focused on some live uh, captured but mostly museum uh, specimens. And they determined primarily that they were um, invertebrates were the prey, but they did find a mouse and they found one tree frog, which uh, now their, their sample size is only 35 frogs. So it's not a big one, um, but I have been doing my own museum study and I'm finding tree frogs much more frequently than they did. The best study and the most comprehensive one is from, from Megan Bishop. Uh, I think it's in Journal of Herpetology. She found that 82% of the diet was terrestrial invertebrates and that it shifted between the, the wet and the dry season. Now, she found earthworms. I've never found an earthworm, but it's probably because I'm dealing with museum specimens. Because from another study, we found that uh, even frozen stomachs that have worms in them, digestion continues even in the freezer and the, the worms just disappear because they don't really have any skeletal parts. So they're just soft, fleshy things and they go away. Um, so that may be the reason why we've seen the difference, but primarily beetles top the list, and then flies, and then spiders. Uh, and in in, um, in her study also, she didn't see very many tree frogs, and I don't think she found any definitive identification of other vertebrates. This is what you normally see. You kind of have to guess what's going down the hatch. So this is a red-legged frog with a crane fly. Um, uh, you guys may know them as mosquito hawks but uh, they're from the family Tipulidae and they are one of the most frequent prey items that we see red-legged frogs eating. This uh, unhappy fella hanging from the mouth of the red-legged frog uh, is actually dead. It looks alive, but it's dead. But uh, our friend Andrew Montreal found that frog and picked it up and went, oh. <laughs> and so uh, this is probably much more common than the diet studies show. And I don't know why we're not picking it up. And in fact, um, there is one theory that uh, floating out there that says that red-legged frogs actually hone in on their breeding pond by hearing the calls of tree frogs, which are their major prey. Um, yet to be proven, but certainly a feasible uh, theory. And then sometimes I have, we mentioned spiders uh, and they do get a lot of spiders. This we, uh, Jeff wrote a publication on. This is a big spider and not normal prey probably for red-legged frogs, but this was a molting tarantula and this is at a cave in Pinnacles National Monument. Somehow that, that tarantula found its way a little bit too close to water. And this is a smallish, but an adult red-legged frog. Uh, and it grabbed it abdomen first, which was pretty good because uh, that means that it doesn't get bitten this way. Um, and, uh, and so down the hatch it went. We didn't actually see the whole event, but we were absolutely gobsmacked to find this. Uh, and then I think it's back to you, Jeff. I'm here, uh, just doing what you did, which is struggling to see my own presentation. <laughs> Let's see, where'd I go? There I am. Okay, am I sharing? No. Let's see, that's just two old guys struggling with too much technology. Sorry, while you're doing that, uh, Rochelle had a question. If they get bitten by a spider, will they die? Probably depends upon the spider. Um, um, 
probably a tarantula would. And it's really a chance to talk about reciprocal predation. So if that was a froglet, the tarantula probably would eat the froglet because there's a big size difference there. But once a frog attains a certain size, there's another, there's a suite of predators that would have been predators when they're smaller that drops out because they're too large to consume. And then sometimes the role gets reversed. Okay, I'm gonna jump right in here and uh, start talking about permits. Now this, for probably 90% of you, this is an important little piece and we do need to talk about it. So uh, I'm gonna really be quite brief about it because we think in the field, it might be a little bit better to talk about this stuff, but there are lots of permits that you're gonna be required to have if you're gonna handle red-legged frogs. So the first one is the sort of the left side here. That's the federal recovery permit permitting well, I actually, I have to step back a little. I put in a BO here. You can handle red-legged frogs under a BO. Uh, if you're not working with a permitted person, it won't count toward getting your own permit. But you do want to be able to work under something. So having a BO does help. Um, then if you kind of cruise toward the left here, or to the right, sorry, I'm dyslexic. Uh, there's my federal permit. It's just one page of about 60 pages. Uh, and then if you go all the way to the right, this is my scientific collecting permit, um, which has its own story and its own issues, but you're going to need one of these too. Um, we'll talk a little bit about getting permits in the field. We'll set everybody down and talk about that and talk about uh, the effort it takes to get them. So permits in general, uh, you could do Section 7 informal consultation, which means you're talking to the service and they're kind of giving you some informal guidance. Uh, this really has a lot of variability in terms of what is uh, formal and what is not formal. Uh, you really have to think about um, what role you're going to play in. Sorry, I had to mute somebody there. Um, what role you're going to play in, in the, uh, handling the frog if you don't need to handle it a lot. Maybe you just stay in the informal consultation under Section 7 and um, you don't really need to get a project permit and you just kind of move along because you don't want to use your personal permit for anything. Uh, this is its own thing. It has its own life and there are workshops just for this. So we'll definitely kind of move through some of this stuff relatively quickly. Uh, under formal consultation under Section 7, generally your, your project's going to get a permit. Say you're going to put in a Walmart somewhere and it's going to uh, be next to a pond and that has red-legged frogs, you're gonna to have to go into formal section seven consultation, which means you're gonna to have to prepare a biological assessment, which we converted to a biological opinion. The biological opinion is your functional permit, and that is the permit your project works under. You don't wanna work under your personal permit. So I'm gonna keep saying that over and over, and we'll say that in the field too. Uh, you might also end up just working under an HCP in lots of areas, specifically counties now. The whole county or half the county will have an HCP. And you can work under an HCP, including handling animals. And you generally, under these kinds of conditions, these last three we've talked about, just need to be approved to work under these kinds of permits. So the project gets permitted under an HCP, you get approved under the HCP, you get to work under the HCP, and you don't have to use your personal permit. Uh, so then there's Section 10. So Section 10 really specifically talks about recovery permits, and they're issued for really recovery and scientific study of a specific animal that's listed as threatened or endangered. Uh, the information that they acquire, and they're going to acquire it if you're working under your permit, is used to try to conserve the species and move its recovery along. So the idea of these kinds of permits is really to benefit the species, to get it delisted, and that, that is really what a recovery permit is. We in consulting came along after the recovery permit process was put in place, and we've turned it into a, a status symbol or an effort to get you know, a project kind of simplified, or you know, we'll use our permitted person to do that work and that'll get approved faster. All those things do happen, but you really, really, really have to be careful about when you use your permit. So your company can get a recovery permit. For example, we work with H.T. Harvey's list of permitted people. They're a company in the South San Francisco Bay, and they have a, a company permit that has 18 people on it. And you get hired by them, you get added to their permit, and 
now you're a permitted person but that doesn't mean you have a permit because if you leave ht harvey in that case you lose the permit so we recommend you get a personal permit even if you're working under a company permit so a recovery permit can go to your company or it can go to you or it can go to both but for you you should not use your personal permit for consulting projects the company should have a recovery permit that means all the responsibility and take and reporting is on your company not on you and we'll again we'll talk about this more when we're in the field so uh, i i put in this little thing here that says not to be used for consulting projects with some exceptions and that means like i have a recovery permit that covers fairy shrimp and tiger salamander and lots of other species and occasionally i'll have to do some sampling under my own permit and that's perfectly fine but if your company has a big project say they're putting in a walmart and there are tiger salamanders nearby and you have to do some trapping they should have their own permit for that it shouldn't go into your personal recovery permit and we're going to say this over and over until we're blue in the face and you're still going to do it but we're going to recommend you don't the fee for this is only a hundred dollars to get a recovery permit we think it's worth the money <clears throat> so your permit will look like this it'll have a list of authorized individuals and you can see the list of authorized individuals on my personal permit is me not my wife, not my neighbor, not my colleagues, not my employees, not my coworkers, not my research partners, nobody but me. And that's because I don't want to be responsible for what somebody else does. The only exception is I have an email that approves Jeff Wilcox to work on workshops with me because I have a permit that says I can do workshops. It's pretty rare. Uh, and Jeff is on that. So he's the only other person in associated with my permits. And the only one that whoever has been my wife has her own permit i didn't put her on mine i got her her own my ex-wife that was a different story she was on my permit and when she decided to end our relationship we, the bigger part of ending our relationship was dealing with the permit not the marriage that's easy that's just a divorce the permit matters who gets the permit i'm telling you right now i don't care what kind of relationship you have or what you call it a partner or a friend or what I don't really care what you call it get them to get their own permit you should have your own they should have their own your company should have their own this is a really critical thing that we will emphasize over and over and over there are other permits that are at the state level so an incidental take permit an ITP is usually project related so this is a bigger project that or a bigger permit that you can get approved for this is perfectly fine to get approved for these but if you're working under an itp you're not getting credit to work uh, for state under um, state approved uh, threatened or endangered animals unless you're working with a person who has their own permit through the state so this is another one of those things that looks like the, the federal government where if you're looking for credit for hours or for handles you need to make sure you're working with a permitted person under the ITP, not just another approved person under an ITP. There are lake and stream bank alteration agreements, LSAAs, that you can get approved to handle tiger salamanders or pond turtles or red-legged frogs or whatever. But again, these aren't going to count toward getting your own permit unless you're working with a permitted person. These things become really critical when you're at that juncture where you want to get a permit of your own all these permits kind of blend together and they become really confusing. We're happy to talk to you about it later on and we'll work with you specifically if you need it, but uh, you should just be aware that these things exist. Here's, here's the level where it matters to you. Scientific collecting permit, very, very few people have, but everybody should have. You're gonna need one of these to work under a BO, an LSAA, an HCP, any of those things I talked about, ITP they're going to start pushing, the state is going to start pushing for you to have a scientific collecting permit. So this is something you can apply for online. I'll show you that in a second. But this allows you to take and collect state uh, animals that are not listed. For species that are listed, you're going to also need an MOU, and we'll talk about that in a second. So there are fees associated with the state permit. So a general use permit is $277, which is a $54 application fee. You pay that right up front. And then when they approve you, it's $223.56. If you want to add anything to it, you have to add another $73.70. 
I don't know why all these weird numbers, they, I don't know why they just don't say, look, it's $225 or it's $75. It would make it a lot easier. But the state has its own ways of doing stuff. So it's, if we move along to the next level, specific use permit, it's $412.96 with an $86.66, sorry, an $86.66 cent uh, application fee, you pay that up front, and then when you're approved, you pay another $323.30. And every time you amendment, amend it, which may be commonly, it's $107.74. Now, I grayed out the general use permit because if you're going to handle red-legged frogs in the state of California, that means almost a certainty if you want to handle them, uh, you don't need and you don't want to apply for a general use permit. You need to apply for a specific use permit. Specific use means you're going to be doing something very specific with a specific animal. So that's the one you're going to go for. The duration of these permits, both general use and specific use, is three years. I have to tell you, I think I know one person with a general use permit. Everybody else I know has a specific use permit. So just ignore the fact that they offer a general use permit. So here's the kind of the opening window when you get out of the SCP portal. It's going to give you all these options. You're not really going to know what to do. There's an online workshop, a, a kind of a video version of what we're doing uh, that you can watch, but it's not going to help you very much either. Uh, what you really want to do is start with the instructions. I think it's a PDF. You can download the thing. Uh, you go to Entity Profiles and fill out the profile piece. And that'll give you a permit number and now you have a permit pending all of the other stuff so it's just says application instructions are going to really be important for you to read this is a very very complex permit we'll talk about it in the field uh, there are lots of ways you can make mistakes and this may take up to unless you ask for something complicated it's probably going to take up to about six months to get so if you need one you should be applying uh, probably by one o'clock today uh, it's going to take a little while to get. It's going to take a while to fill out the application. It took me about 10 hours to do mine, roughly. I'm confusing mine with my wife's. I helped her. I think hers took eight. Mine took 10 to 15. It took a couple of days to do. So be aware that it's going to take some time. So once you get your SCP, and that means when you're, you've paid that final fee and you still want to handle red-legged frogs, now you need to go back to uh, CDFW and ask for a memorandum of understanding. So there, uh, this is kind of an informal version of a permit where they unofficially write you a letter that says, yeah, we're going to let you go ahead and handle special status or fully protected species. And here's what we're going to tell you are your restrictions and guidelines. And here's what we're going to say is the reporting requirements. And you're going to have to have that valid for every single scientific or sorry uh special status species you're going to work with so special status includes threatened state threatened state endangered fully protected and all species of concern uh, and yes i'm going to just stop here for a second just to say yes i know it's complicated yes i know i'm giving you a lot of information uh, i'm aware that you can ask a lot of questions at the field portion which is going to be a better time to do it and then you can always email me with more specific questions but uh, we're just trying to give you the kind of the look through the window and see what you're up against uh, version here. So each of these permits has a reporting requirement and they're very, very critical to maintaining your permit. So uh, here we have a 90 day notice of intent to collect. So you got to, for the federal government, you got to let them know 90 days in advance that you're going to go collect. Uh, if you have take, you have to let them know within 24 hours. Then within 90 days of finishing your project, you got to let them know you finished it. And then there's an annual report within the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service office that you work that you have to submit every single year. And in the absence of this, you will lose your permit. For the state, they have similar things, but they're different. So you have to notify them within two weeks before you start work. Uh, there is a mandatory electronic submission a wildlife report that you have to submit within about 30 days to with uh, renewal or expiration. And then there's annual reporting for your MOU. The uh, frustrating and sort of sad thing is there aren't templates for all of these things. You're really going to have to ask someone for help or give it a shot and do your best. So how this affects you, this is really what people tend to pay attention to. 
Uh, to handle wildlife, you're going to use, like I said, your spe specific use SCP, scientific collecting permit. You're going to need an MOU for special species, species that you've, you have named specifically. And you're going to need for a red-legged frog or a federal recovery permit. Uh, or you're going to need a department or in service approval under some other larger permit that you will get credit for in terms of trying to get your own permit. So keep all that stuff in mind. You're going to need some permit to handle red-legged frogs at some level. And if you don't, that means you're not really being qualified. You're not, and you're not legally able to handle the frog. So uh, continuing how this affects you, there are roles and responsibilities that you're going to have to actually pay attention to. So when you get your permit and you become a permitted individual, you're expected to read and know the limitations of your permit. We're going to talk to you about this in the field because it has relevance to the people leading this workshop. Uh, you're also going to have, you're going to uh, now meet the knowingly standard. That really means that legally you're responsible to the state of California. The federal government has a different standard, but at the state of California level, they will say things like, did you knowingly handle it without a permit? And you say, no, I didn't know. But you, once you have a permit, you have already met the knowingly standard, whether you know the details or not. So now you're a responsible individual who knows these things. Even if you don't know them, you're going to have to learn them. So continuing down this list, uh, you accept and are held responsible for take. So take occurs under your permit, you're responsible for it. That's why we say don't use your permit for your company's projects, because you're the one responsible for it. Your company should have their own permit. And then you're expected to enforce the conditions of your permit and or report the lack of compliance. This is one of those tricky things where you're a permitted per person, you're on a project site, they run over a tiger salamander, uh, your company says, well, it was an accident. Uh, we, you know, this isn't going to happen again. We don't think we need to really uh, report this. Trust me, this does happen with some companies and we know a lot of them. Uh, but you're a permitted person who saw that. You're responsible for reporting it. You are as an individual who holds a permit. So now you work for a company who doesn't want to report it, but you're responsible for reporting it. Now you get into trouble for not reporting it, even if your company didn't report it. So keep those things in mind. Maybe you don't want to get a, a permit because it's just too much responsibility or it's going to conflict with your company's morals. That's up to you. But once you get a permit, you're going to be the responsible person on the project. So I'm going to talk about habits after Jeff does his next section, and then we'll uh, talk about the field situation and what you guys should expect. So Jeff's going to jump in. I do see two questions in the chat that came in right when I started. Oh, it just says more soon, more soon. Uh, Jeff, I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, so how does a company go about getting its own permit? Do you still have to be a permitting? Do you still have to be like the lead permitter in order for your company to then get their permit? Or how does that work? Because I feel like a lot of consulting firms just put it on the individual bio instead of getting their own company permits. Yeah, they definitely do that, and it's un it's unethical to do that. That is just not that's not the right way to go. The company has to select somebody that they're going to have fill out the application for an SCP. You don't need necessarily a responsible person. There can be an entity permit, so your company can get an SCP. Uh, with the federal government, your company can get it, but there will have to be an individual responsible to start it off. Generally, that's going to be somebody who has enough skill to get a permit, so it has all the experience and the hours and that sort of thing. And then your company takes ownership, so it's an entity permit with a responsible person being the permittee. Then as I would say to you, let's just say you're the one who does that, you should then jump off the permit, get your own permit, and not be the responsible party for the permit. The permit uh, recipient then becomes the president of the company or the lead of the company, and now they're the responsible party for it. And then they can designate anybody they want, but you as an individual want to avoid being the responsible party for your company. And I say that from, here's just sort of a random sample of uh, uh, examples. Uh, I know companies in my area that do work that is, would just be very generous and say substandard. And and I know many people who work for those companies who contact me and say, 
listen, they're telling me I can't report these five dead salamanders or these three dead uh, spadefoot toads or whatever, because it's going to stop the project. And I say, well, you just told me I'm a permit holder. I got to report it now. So I report it. And I don't have any problem doing that. I'm not trying to get that company into trouble. I'm just trying to make sure I maintain my own permit. The permitted, the whatever permitted person on that project site, uh, they find they're going to say you're the responsible person. So if your company has a permit, they'll go to the company. If there's an individual, they're going to go to the individual. And those people are going to lose their permit. And when you lose your permit, you usually lose it for about 10 years. Well, for precisely 10 years. And I know that firsthand. So you don't want to be the person who's responsible for your company's entity permit. Lots of companies have them now. It's perfectly fine and it's a good thing they, they do because they should not be saying to me, even as a subcontractor, you're responsible. That has to be my judgment. I decide, okay, I put my own permit on the line. I'll do that. These are, these are really complex situations that are very delicate because lots of companies have different ways of persuading their employees to do what they want them to do. I would just say, don't do it. That's just my opinion. It doesn't mean I'm directing you. I would just say, and Jeff has heard me say, and he says this too, never do it. But that's up to you. It, it, you know, you want your job, that's fine. But there's no chance I would ever do that. Well, I'm just asking, because it's good to hear your professional opinion. I've worked under a lot of SCPs and other like HCPs or habitat management conservation plans. We talked about this a little before where I'm under, you know, an agency permit or I'm under a project permit. And so it allows me to be authorized, but I'm not held directly responsible in the same way as if I was the permittee. The problem about that is then later when I go to get my own permits, because I've worked so many projects like that, they're like, no, you weren't working directly under a permit holder. We won't give you your permit. Yes. So it becomes this catch 22 be between like when you're covering your butt and making sure you're okay and you're not being held liable personally, then it almost feels like you're getting punished for trying to be more on the up and up because now the agencies won't give you a permit. I agree completely. And here's the way we see it. And, the, and Jeff and I have encountered this so much and is why we do level two workshops now. So you as a person work under all those different permits and get approved, that's your work life. Then you have this thing called a personal life where you get your personal uh, recovery permit under your personal life. So in your personal life, even if it's funded by your company, you, you go out and you help Jeff on his project site to do some telemetry on red-legged frogs and you build those hours and get that experience and you go get a permit in that way. So it's separate from your company, even if your company's paying for it, maybe sometimes and we know this, they pay for the level two workshops or they pay for extra time that people come up and spend with Jeff or me. Uh, that really is sort of on this personal track. And you have to see that as, well, Lisa, I, I'm, I know I'm going to be able to market myself to another company later. I'll just pay for it myself and get it on my own. And that'll have value for me as a, as a biologist. My company does its own thing and I get protected because I get, I'm a qualified biologist. I'm not a responsible a permit holder. So we do tell people to separate those two things out, even if your company funds and supports your personal attempt to get a permit, we think you need to keep that as separate as you can. Take the money and the support, but make sure it's personal. So then in order to get the companies, if the company doesn't already have a permit for that species, but in order to get that, you still have to go through having someone who's willing to be the responsible party yeah. temporarily. Yeah. It wouldn't be me. Yeah, I think that's I, where the hard part gets yeah. comes about because there's that expectation that you're going to help get them their permit. Absolutely true. So it's the, uh, which comes first chicken or the egg, right? Like you want them to have, you want the company to have the permit, but someone's got to take the risk in order to ensure that they get their permit. And there are companies where I say, I would say, yeah, I think it's fair. That's a, that's a good company. If they make a mistake, it's an accident. And everybody knows it. And there are companies where I would say, you're in a shitload of trouble. And if you're going to take on that responsibility, please just lose my email address. <laughs> and we know those companies and we, and when you're working for them, it may not be as easy to see, but ask around because we all know the reputations of the other companies. And there are some that I would just say to somebody, Listen, I'll help you personally, but I will never help you with your company ever. And that that's just the standard I have to make now. And be, it's mostly because, and Jeff knows this very well, my reputation only matters as far as the agency sees me. Right. It, 
if if other consultants think of me as a jerk or kind of uh, you know protective of my permit and i don't think i'm that way but uh it doesn't matter to me and my clients never like me because i'm taking their money so what do i care it's really how the agency sees me that's why I can do so much now in my professional life because the agencies trust me. So that's where I work toward building my relationship and my reputation. Well, I appreciate your candor. I think that's one of the things that I find the most frustrating going from research background to consulting is there's this, this kind of fake, uh, I don't know, there's kind of this fake glossiness to consulting firm as a whole, and I'm saying this as a, someone who worked for a consulting firm and I've worked for several consulting firms, um, they're definitely not all created equal, but there's often this tendency to pretend that everyone's on the up and up when I've worked on other projects with some companies where I went out and you know ended up covering for some other biologists and cleaning up their mess because they didn't know what they were doing. Um, and I feel like there's not the same level of candor with that when it comes to consulting firms as it does when you're talking about working with nonprofits or when you're working with research agencies. Um, I definitely noticed the difference. Like when I was working for research, people would call you on it in a quick second versus working with consultants. There's a lot of like, oh, well, maybe they just didn't know, but it's our responsibility as resource specialists to know our resource. And I feel like that gets lost sometimes in consulting. Um, and it's become more and more of a standard to expect you to come with all these bells and whistles and permits um, right out of the box to s accommodate the company without necessarily accommodating your personal growth or your ability to maintain your reputation with the agencies, which at the bottom line as biologists, like if your primary concern is not the resource, you shouldn't be in this industry, in my opinion. But that, well, I know that's not shared by everyone in the consulting <laughs> industry. I get a lot of flack for that sometimes when I go to conferences, but then, again, I'm not, I'm not a lifer consultant. Like, mm -hmm. But I find that very frustrating because it, unlike when I was working in research, in research, it was really easy to know who to go to and who not to. Whereas with consulting, and there's a lot more gray area and it's a lot harder with companies being bought out. You know, you'll get some people who are awesome and then other people not so much. Um, so yeah, having, having someone with your level of experience be able to give us little tidbits on maybe who those of us who are trying to work on an honest career want to avoid um, is the type of information we can't get anywhere else. So I really appreciate your candor. Or in the field. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely yes, more we, in the field. We will and, definitely get into that in the field. And thank you for saying it. So it's not just two old guys saying it. We we appreciate you yeah. jumping in with that. Yeah, no, well said. And uh, a lot of good things. Uh, so were said uh, we are going to go over here. I'm sorry about that. We'll, we'll speed it up. I'll definitely speed up the habitat section. But Jeff's going to talk about predators and prey. Uh, we will say a lot more about all of this stuff in the field. Uh, we're two old guys who don't care what people think of us anymore. So uh, we're more than happy to be candid about it. But we're hoping that's going to benefit you. If you don't like it, eh, you know, just avoid the next workshop. <laughs> okay, so predators and general threats. Uh, easy for me to say, general threats. Um, one of the emerging fields is looking at um, uh, Trematode worms uh, and, and parasites in general in, in frogs. Uh, the frog on your left is actually not a frog yet. It's actually a larva because it has a tail here. <clears throat> you can see it still hasn't fully resorbed its lungs. You can see that, or sorry, its gills. That's the red mark here. But it's already got a lot of terrestrial uh, 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 features. So it's got both legs, uh, et cetera. It's got our little mustache showing up. But the elephant in the living room, of course, is that it's got more than two hind legs. It's actually got uh, one more and a stub. And so what happens is there's a parasite called Riberoa uh, ondantra, ondantra because they first found it in, in muskrats. It's a flatworm in one of its life stages, infects the joints where the, the, uh, the bones are growing. And I'm not sure exactly by what process, but it causes it to, to uh, causes it to to grow either extra limbs or malformed limbs in some way that normally doesn't directly kill the frog, but it certainly makes it vulnerable to predators. The strategy being that the sexual form, excuse me, the, the reproductive form of the Riberoa flatworm <clears throat> needs a definitive host, which is where it carries on sexual reproduction. That definitive host in most cases is a bird. So the bird comes along, finds a wounded frog, picks it, ingests the, the frog, digests it, and then releases these sexually reproductive flatworms into its own gut, 
they reproduce in its gut and then it defecates into the water. The eggs are picked up by aquatic snails and the cycle starts all over again. Uh, so that was the first one, that was Riveroya. Uh, and, and the sign said also, if you find these malformations, please let us know. There are a lot of active studies going on. The next one here is the yellow grub. This is Clonostoma marginatum. This is uh, also a parasite for fishes, and you can find it oftentimes on the outside of fishes. It turns out that fishes and frogs are the definitive host for this particular one. So the sexual reproduction is happening inside the frog. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I've cut, uh, circled the insisted uh, clonostomum uh, larvae in development. This is actually an inflated frog lung. That's the heart. And then this is a deflated frog lung here, just to give you some idea. But they're all sort of flipped up just to get out of the way so I can see these. And then the, the, on the right is what the yellow worms look like when they're out of these cysts. Here's a more common one. And this one is a lot more subtle because we don't generally see all the life stages. We only see this life stage when we open it up and look at the kidneys. So these are the kidneys of a frog. Um, and we also have our old friend clonostomum next to the kidney, but the kidneys are these elongate formations. And then these are the, the yellow sort of squiggles on top are the adrenal glands. The parasites are these groupings of clear, uh, little uh, beads and also the colored ones. But you can see throughout even pale here and up here where I pointed them out, but even here, some are just forming. So what happens is they get, they proliferate to the point that the kidneys lose their function. And oftentimes you'll see, uh, for example, a, a, a larva, a tiger salamander larva or a frog larva that looks like it's sucked in a bunch of air and became a balloon because they can no longer uh, balance their own water content. So that's normally what you see. This one can be fatal in large enough numbers. This one's a pretty gross one. Um, this is the lung fluke, Hematolocus. I don't know the species. On the left-hand side, I dug uh, these four out of this portion of red-legged frog lung. Uh, these are actually alive, but since it's a still picture, you can't tell, but they're squiggling across the screen. These are from the decomposed body of a foothill yellow-legged frog, and these are the same genus, but probably a different species, hasn't been keyed yet. We sent these off to the Peter Johnson lab in, in uh, Colorado. But um, so they do occur in both species. Uh, and with hematolocus also, uh, frogs are the definitive host, so sexual reproduction happens in the lungs. And then it passes through the bloodstream and then out into the feces, where it infects the uh, larvae of dragonflies. And then the dragonfly larvae become uh, incapacitated and frogs will come and eat them, thereby completing the cycle. This is a really gross picture. This frog was actually alive when I caught it. Um, and the, the uh, researcher we sent it to thought it might be a bacterial infection. Um, it could have been a viral infection. Ronavirus is a, is a virus that affects frogs worldwide and kills a lot of them. Red-legged syndrome also, that's a bacterial one. And often sign you'll see, a, when you flip them over, you'll see a rosacea or a, a flush colored red skin on the, on the ventral side of a frog. That's where it's more noticeable. It also can be fatal. And then I'm not gonna go into any detail, but, but there's a fungal infection going around the world, wiping out entire species, especially in the case of golden toad, for example. And chytridium mycosis, excuse me, is a fungus that affects the skin of the frog and it usually is fatal in their transitional stage, whether they're molting uh, from a, a, a breeding skin to, or sorry, a non-breeding skin to a breeding skin, as in uh, newts that go from a rough skin to a smooth skin, or in the case of transitioning from um, uh, larval skin to adult skin. So if you find adults that are infected, they are probably not gonna be fatally infected. They're probably going to be carriers. It usually kills frogs and salamanders at some transitional stage in their life. But we never got a definitive answer on this one. It was just gross. Uh, Jeff spoke earlier about leeches. The more we investigate, the more we think that they may not be really affecting frogs because we don't find wounds when we remove leeches. You have to really pull them off, uh, uh, but we don't seem to normally find wounds. So it could be that they're just phoretic which simply means that they're using the frog to hitch a ride. So we find them on turtles also, and we find big ones on turtles. And uh, uh, Jeff Alvarez has actually got an active project 
looking at how many species we have in the system and what species affect what frogs and if there's a difference between those. Uh, and then predators of larvae. So uh, Mahmoud asked about specific predators of red-legged frogs. There aren't any, um, how would you say, there aren't any notorious uh, predator-prey matchups that I know of, but we spoke of earlier of um, reciprocal predation. So uh, snakes eat a lot of tadpoles. In this case, it's eating a bullfrog tadpole. Uh, the garter snake is eating a bullfrog tadpole, but of course the same thing happens with red-legged frogs. Um, and it swallowed it or grabbed it by the head and then turned it around and swallowed it tail first, which was quite cool. Bullfrogs eat a ton of red-legged frogs and they eat a lot of metamorphs or new froglets. Um, again, whatever they can fit in their mouth. And then aquatic birds eat a lot of frogs as well. This is a pied-billed grebe. I don't have any prima facie evidence that they eat frogs, but I'm sure that they do. Herons, egrets, um, red-shouldered hawks actually are riparian raptors and they eat a lot of uh, riparian things. So probably frogs um, and perhaps some owls too. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then now and then, um, you know, we have to watch something that breaks our heart because we love snakes. Uh, but sometimes, you know, snakes eat endangered stuff. And that happens to be a, a, a red-legged frog froglet going down the hatch of a, of a uh, garter snake. Garter snake. Yeah. Um, Mahmoud asked specifically about uh, ringneck snakes, and I have not found a ringneck snake in the stomach of any frog, actually, but we found a lot of sharp tail snakes which were about the same size. Never have had evidence of reciprocal predation, though, of a ringneck or a sharp tail eating a frog. We have not seen that. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, we just haven't seen it. And then here's an example, uh, lower left, this is at Los Vaqueros Reservoir. So, the, here's the stomach and I opened it up and pulled this out. And this is actually a California red-legged frog. It's about 70 millimeters from the snout to the, to the uh, urostyle. And this female bullfrog uh, is about 160 uh, millimeters in that same measurement. So she's about twice the size uh, and didn't have any problem at all wolfing down this uh, poor red-legged frog. And then this is a bullfrog, approximately the same size. And you can see here the backbone of a partially digested red-legged frog. Here's an eye in the backbone here. So they eat a lot of them. I found as many as five uh, uh, froglets, red-legged frog froglets in one bullfrog. And I think that might be the end of me, Jeff. I was just muttering that was fast. Let's see, um, yeah, share screen, okay, okay, so uh, let me just jump right in here and um, kind of get through the habitats part and then we'll uh, speak briefly about what to expect in the field and make sure we get those questions answered before we go. So we were planning on ending around 12 noon, it looks like we'll be a little late, but we won't be too much later than that. Uh, so habitats range from um, aquatic features, but also include upland features. Jeff has talked a lot about that, and we'll, we'll be drilling that into you in the field for sure. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that in the field. So um, one of the things that I think uh, people get fixated on is that the aquatic feature is the habitat for red-legged frogs, and it is but it includes all the um, upland habitats surrounding these aquatic features too. But I'll go through a range of aquatic features just to kind of uh, sort of commiserate with that idea because I do the same thing. Stock ponds clearly are a habitat, although they're not natural habitat, they're all artificial, which is something Jeff mentioned earlier on. Uh, let me get over here. Uh, freshwater marshes, this is Leadsen Marsh, but we find red-legged frogs in lots of freshwater mar marshes. They're just hard to find because you have to kind of trample through and you shouldn't be trampling through them if you're doing protocol surveys. So that makes them hard to find. You might find them using vocalizations, but they kind of mumble a lot. So uh, get, getting their, their vocalizations detected isn't always easy, but they definitely occur in this kind of habitat, do well in it. Uh, coastal creeks, they, uh, this seems more like uh, yellow-legged frog habitat, but we find red-legged frogs in this kind of habitat as well, typically in the slower sections and little eddies and uh, isolated pools along these creeks. 
Creeks in the Sierra foothills are about the same, except that uh, most of them are on private property. So we have to start surveying more of those to determine whether or not red-legged frogs occur in these kinds of habitats. But certainly they're capable of doing it. They evolved with this kind of habitat and this is normal for them. We just don't spend a lot of time surveying for them in these. Uh, there are ponds in the Sierra foothills that we survey uh, for red-legged frogs. This is at the Big Gun site. This is Michigan Bluff area. Uh, Westervelt manages this site. We use it for part of our one of our five visits for red-legged frog level two. Uh, we found uh, hundreds of larvae in there this time around and lots of adults. Uh, lots of other species too come along with it. Sierra garter snake, uh, terrestrial garter snake, red-sided garter snake, etc. So they do occur in these sites and, uh, and do quite well uh, breed very easily and uh, robustly in these kinds of sites. So they should be checked in every uh, Sierra site you can get to, you should check for red legged frogs because we have a lot to learn. Uh, drainages and agricultural dish ditches get ignored for red legged frogs mostly because they're nasty and everybody says, oh, they don't occur on the floor of the Central Valley. Uh, that just isn't true. Jeff and I and my wife did a, a poster presentation, but it didn't get out very far. So we'll probably do a publication on it to show all the drainages in the Central Valley that the red legged frogs occur in. It's I think it's something like 45 different areas. So they do occur in the Central Valley. You need to survey for them in order to find them. So if we just blow them off because Jennings and Hayes once wrote they're extirpated from the Central Valley, uh, that that is a problem in itself. We need to look because things recolonize sites all of the time. And uh, back there in 94, Jennings and Hayes weren't checking every site anyway. So uh, I know both of them and I respect Hayes a lot. So. Uh, I still say just because they said it doesn't mean anything, go out and look. Created wetlands are uh, really good sites for red-legged frogs. These are typically mitigation ponds. They support red-legged frogs. They get red-legged frogs very quickly. Uh, the creek in the background there behind the pond had frogs in it before the pond was constructed. And with a, within a month of the pond being inundated, these all five of the ponds that are at this site uh, did get red-legged frogs colonizing them. So uh, they, they will access and use these sites for decades and do really well in them. A perennial versus ephemeral creeks, we get this kind of a, a lot, you know, if the creek is dry when you get there, people will say, oh, it can't be habitat because the frogs are, um, they can't survive in a dry creek, but they do quite well. Uh, in the Bay Area, beavers make lots of these pools perennial but otherwise they would be ephemeral and the red-legged frogs just move into the upland and wait for the creek to fill up again and they get right back in. So ephemeral really means nothing for red-legged frog. They do quite well in these kinds of systems. And that includes ephemeral ponds. This is a pond I checked for 20 years in a row, five times a year. This thing dried every single year and every single year it had red-legged frogs. So ephemeral means nothing except that it's dry at the time of your visit. You need to wait another season, get out there when it has water, and check it then. Coastal Lagoons, this is um, Abbott's Lagoon at Point Reyes. We visit the site during our, foot, our sorry, California Red-Legged Frog Level 2 workshop. This is a brackish water pool. It's very, very large. Uh, you can see it's right next to the ocean and uh, does get wave wash over, so get salt water in it quite frequently. And then most of the rest of the year, it's just brackish. Uh, has red-legged frogs. They breed in it. Uh, they're common here. We see them almost every visit we go to. So just because it's right next to the beach and you might be getting salt uh, on your boots when you let them dry out, that doesn't mean red-legged frogs won't be there. They can use these kinds of sites as well. Uh, this is also a point raised. This is a in a sand dune. These sand dune pools get water that is groundwater, comes right up, uh, might be dry one day, the next day it's wet. Uh, just really depends on the fluctuations of the water. Um, and so uh, freshwater floats on top of saltwater. If you don't already know that, you'll get a layer of saltwater on the bottom and freshwater on the top. And if this is underground and the, and the tide comes in, that means saltwater is coming into the, the aquifer underground. It pushes the freshwater up, so you'll get these sites to look wet one day and dry the next but red-legged frogs will appear in them overnight. So just because they're drying every couple of days and then refilling doesn't mean anything. The red legged just move into the upland, wait it out, come back when the water, uh, when the site is hydrated, and uh, they'll just work with that system very, very easily. 
Uh, sort of, we put these in there because not many people are going to get down to our Baja sites, but uh, in Baja, California, this is Little Arroyo, Little Creek that goes through the desert down there. And red-legged frogs are pretty common in this area. Uh, we search, when we're down there every year, we search through, through these creeks and find dozens of red-legged frogs. They're easy to find. They're quite common and use these kinds of sites, despite the fact that it's surrounded by desert. And then uh, this is really just depicting uh, something a little bit different, and that is to say, yes, the aquatic site means something, but the area around the aquatic site is as occupied as, as the aquatic site. So on a given day or even a given night, and Jeff has alluded to this, you'll find red-legged frogs inside the aquatic site. And then in the evening, they'll be out here in the upland in this red circular area uh, feeding. So uh, Jeff mentioned that they're feeding mostly on terrestrial prey. That's where they're feeding on them around the pond itself. So when you're doing surveys, you want to watch where you're walking because you can step on them quite easily. And then this is the same site, but I've pulled back quite a bit only to say red-legged frogs are going to use a bigger area than we we're saying in the first slide, the previous slide. Uh, to disperse, to move around, to uh, maybe wait out a dry period. Uh, this happens to be adjacent to a reservoir, a freshwater reservoir that does have predatory fish, but the red-legged frogs use the reservoir as well. So you can't just say, well, it has fish in it or has bullfrogs or has crayfish, therefore there are no red legs. We find them in these sites all of the time. The frogs make the rules, so just go check. Uh, most of us are getting paid to do surveys, so why not go check? And then this is really just to emphasize uplands. You got to check uplands. You, it's not easy to find red legs in these areas. I'm not saying go out and do some terrestrial surveys for red legs to find them, but they use the uplands surrounding aquatic features. So if you're going to protect their an aquatic feature, you got to protect the surrounding uplands too. We don't know exactly how much. So right now we're saying about 250 feet because that encompasses most, not all, but most of uh, Western pond turtle nests. So if you're going to protect one, protect them both and make it as big a buffer as you can get. And then something like this is showing a creek right through the center. It's going uh, up and down right through the center. Jeff and I surveyed this for many years. I was on the site for about 20 years. Uh, but all of that upland surrounding it also has red-legged frogs. And we know that because there's these random vernal pools and puddles and ditches and trenches and other things that will get wet in the winter and we'll find red-legged frogs in them. And as they dry up, the red-legged frogs move off to some other sites. Sometimes they're going to be in the uplands. Sometimes they're going to move to this creek right through the center. We just don't know. Like I say, the frogs make the rules, so we got to go out and figure out what they're doing. Uh, again, just emphasizing uplands, 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 because it doesn't take a big uh, riparian zone to hold on to red-legged frogs. So the arrow in the back there in the center is just showing some swales and uh, just small drainages, but we find red-legged frogs in there too, particularly in the winter when they're moving around a lot more. And then Jeff and I just had this uh, uh, publication come out recently. We can send it to you if you're interested. We find red-legged frogs in spring boxes quite commonly. And by quite commonly, I, I would say every time we find a spring box that's wet, we find red-legged frogs in it. Uh, they do quite well in these kinds of systems. This one had some egg masses in it. This is a remnant of it. So look in those kinds of features too. Uh, Jeff talked about red leggeds using these little wet drainages to move around. And certainly they're going to do that. And if they're doing it and they come across a spring box like this, they're going to just use it. So that is uh, our... <laughs> Sorry, I was laughing at the chat here. Um, that is our presentation for the red-legged frog level one workshop. Um, I'm laughing because Angel has gone to the desert, sorry, gone to Mexico with us and our colleagues down there don't call it desert, we call it desert, they just call it chaparral and he made a little comment about it. Uh, I would say that um, we should just talk briefly about, um, and Jeff should jump in here too, we should talk briefly about our uh, field days and, and answer any questions you guys have and certainly answer any questions about the presentation and then we should cut you free since it's already after 12. But if you have questions about the field day, this is the time to do it. Uh, I would generally say you should have some sort of set of rubber boots, hip waders or chest waders. I would say um, any of those will do because whatever we catch, we're going to bring to the shoreline and we're going to talk about it. 
our general goal will be for you guys to see different habitat types, to see uh, some occupied habitat, to spend at least four hours with permitted biologists, which you'll, you'll get credit for, to give you the opportunity to ask any questions you have. Uh, you, I see uh, Christine is asking about high clearance vehicle. We've had Priuses on the site commonly. Now you won't want to drive 45 on the rocky road, but every car should be able to make it. If you have a motorcycle, even that would make it. You should have all received the um, the email that said we should be meeting at the Safeway parking lot, and I will escort you up. Uh, Chris, who we know well, is asking if we're going to make the uh, video available. We'll make it available to you if you ask for it specifically. But if we make it public, then everybody just watches it and they don't bother doing the workshop, even though that won't count as anything. Because if you heard me early on, we send all of your names into the agencies so they know you made it to the lecture portion. We will then check your names off when you come to the field portion. So the agencies will know whether you made it to the lecture portion, field portion, or both. It only counts if you make it to both. So uh, please try to make it to the field portion. That's certainly the more fun part anyway, instead of just listening to these two old guys rambling. Um, you should bring a hat. I think I mentioned some of these things, a camera, uh, something to eat, because we're going to be there over a meal time. Shane is asking if... Uh, yeah, you can confirm with me which day you're in the field if you forgot which day you're in the field. I won't say it out loud. Um, it's not going to be possible to switch back and forth because each of the field days are full. Uh, and the the gaps, we have a couple of people who never made it to the lecture. I'll email them before I kick them out uh, because we do want to push our waiting list people, at least two of them, right into those slots. And... Um, I think those two people who know themselves are going to make it into the field and I'll talk to them about their availability. Uh, we do commonly have to discuss, Jeff and I, about the availability of the presentations for you guys. Uh, what we'll probably do is just have the whole entire presentation on uh, my YouTube channel and give you guys access to that so you can just uh, kind of scan through it looking for the particular slide you need or listen to these two old guys rambling all over again. Uh, that'll probably be the best way for us to do it just because um, some of our photos are not our photos. And even though we gave photo credit, we're not given permission to hand them out. So I think we'll just keep it on the YouTube channel. Jeff, you want to jump in? I do, yeah. So um, those who are coming tomorrow and, and who plan to stay overnight, we have some extenuating circumstances just for that night. Uh, we are, the ranch where I work, is planning a prescribed fire the next day, which means that if you plan to spend the night, you'll have to either be out by 8 a.m. or you'll be trapped here until afternoon. So that's something to consider. Um, Jeff and I will, will cook you breakfast if you stay over, but then we'll also probably give you a swift boot in the bottom because uh, otherwise you'll be trapped here. So the uh, fire crew will probably start accumulating here at about 8.30 in the morning, and then they'll have the road blocked off for at least a couple of hours. So, um, in prescribed what, fires, sorry. At what time will they block the road? Probably, well, at 9 a.m. for sure, that's when the tailgate happens. Okay. But they'll probably start arriving around 8.30, which means you're going to have uh, big engines coming up a narrow road. So, if that gives you the willies, then that's something to consider. But, um, but I can't, I mean, I'm sorry about that. I can't do anything about it. Prescribed fire has its own scheduling. I mean, you really just have to take advantage of it when you can. So uh, it just landed that way. And that's tomorrow. It's uh, the, the fire is Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I mean, yeah. this week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But only this week, we're only burning once this spring. So it won't happen to the next two classes. And then we had a question in the chat about uh, flashlight brightness. So the protocol is going to say 400 lumens. So you want something around that much. If you don't have it, we have plenty to loan out. So mm -hmm. don't worry about that part too much. We don't have any waders or boots to loan out, but we have lots and lots of flashlights. So bring your own binoculars, everything you need on a personal level, something to eat, uh, waders or boots or whatever you have. And don't worry so much about the light. We'll have extras for that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we do have rattlesnakes and poison oak and the usual things that go along with California field uh, opportunities. Just, just by way of warning, we have mountain lions too, but we don't pet them or anything. Um, and we do have, uh, we, we try to avoid poison oak as best we can. Even if we don't get it, we try to stay out of it because if we get in it and touch somebody who does get it, then you know it kind of spoils their fun. So we just try to avoid it altogether, but we do have tech new uh, and things you can clean up with afterward. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now because I don't think it's necessary to keep going. Um, 